Allah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala amma ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh How's everybody doing? Alhamdulillah, good stuff So uh, today we are entering into surah 110 which is surah Nasr and uh, this surah if you want to know the historical background about it it is Fath Mecca, the conquest of Mecca and the thing is I could say that and then get into the surah immediately but I thought that if I did that, it would be doing a great injustice because you're just saying that, oh, the Prophet ﷺ was able to, uh, you know, conquer Mecca and then let's move on. And that's just, that doesn't do it justice. And so I thought I'd spend, inshallah, most of the day today, inshallah, at least letting you know just how important the conquest of Mecca was and why it was so important. And then inshallah, perhaps not next week because next week is Eid and then, so two weeks from now, we'll get back to the surah and actually go word for word and actually explore the surah itself. So this week is more the introduction and just understanding and appreciating how monumental uh, uh, the conquest of Mecca truly was. So the first thing, if you really want to understand the history of it, you got to go way back, like thousands of years back to the time of Ibrahim a.s. When Ibrahim, Abraham, Ibrahim a.s. built the Kaaba. He builds the Kaaba because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to. And uh, he makes this house of worship and Allah tells him, call the people. He says, yeah, Allah, it's just the middle of the desert. Who's going to answer? He says, you make the call, I'll make sure people come. So this now call is made and alhamdulillah, you know, we're in the Hajj season. Alhamdulillah, how many people? Millions, literally, millions of people from around the world are now going to the place that Ibrahim a.s. built uh, thousands of years ago. And what was the dua that Ibrahim a.s. made in Surah Baqarah verse 129? He made the dua, رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا What does that mean? He said, My Lord, send, from, send, uh, send, them, uh, send from amongst them, as in from the Arabs themselves or from the, these people themselves, send from amongst them a messenger, Rasulan, minhum yatlu alayhim ayati, that he will recite their, he will recite your ayat, he will recite your miraculous verses. And uh, he will teach them the Quran, the kitab, and the hikmah, and which is often translated here as the sunnah, wisdom. And so he will teach them, he will, you know, share the ayat, the miraculous ayat with them, he will teach them the Quran, he will teach them the sunnah, and he will purify him, purify them, wa yuzakkihim. So, who is the Prophet ﷺ making, excuse me, who is Ibrahim ﷺ making dua for to come? Muhammad, Muhammad ﷺ, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. And so Ibrahim way back when makes this dua and says, Oh Allah, I'm building this house, I'm calling the people, I want these people to be righteous, to worship you, to be good slaves of yours. And if inevitably as time goes forward they start to stray, send from amongst them, from amongst their own people, send them a messenger that will have these qualities and that will guide them back to the path. The Prophet ﷺ was sent, was given revelation at the age of 40 and he was, the main mission, the number one mission that he had was, well, obviously the number one mission is to spread the guidance of Islam, right, obviously. But a specific, a certain, like if you want, like a tangible mission that has to be accomplished is removing the idolatry from Umm al-Qura, which is Mecca. Mecca is called Umm al-Qura. What does that mean? The mother of all cities. Because it was the center. It was the biggest, it was the cosmopolitan, it was the largest uh, city, and it was basically the center of all of Arabia. And it was founded by Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's supposed to be a central location that attracts and that is, is focused entirely on the worship of Allah, and now it has been corrupted, and now you have 360 idols that surround this Kaaba. And so imagine the difficulty of, of, of being told, you have this message, by the way. You have to go to these people and convince them that all of their beliefs are wrong. I mean, just, just that in and of itself is how hard is that. On top of that, now they have to change their religion. And now keep in mind that these are people that are very tribal. They have a lot of pride in their ancestry. So now you have to throw away, you know, your, your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather. They believed in idols. You have to throw all that away. You want the, these people who are so obsessed with their ancestry, you want them to throw their whole legacy away? Yes, go back to your true legacy, your really great, 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 great grandfather, Ibrahim a.s. Go back to that legacy. So this is very difficult. And a third element that makes it so hard is what? The fact that these people had an economy that was entirely dependent upon idolatry. Because they were the center of shirk. They were the center of, of this idolatry. And people would come and buy and purchase idols. They would, you know, come and worship their idols from there. And so these people had a sort of religious uh, uh, authority. And it's because of that religious authority that whenever they would travel, nobody would harass them. Nobody would uh, attack their caravan. There would be no raiding 
Why? Because, oh, these are the people from Mecca. I mean, if we attack them today, then tomorrow they're going to go smash our idol or something, you know? Maybe these gods will be upset with us, and so on and so forth. So, they had this sort of holy status. It was also an economic factor. It was a safety factor. There's so many reasons why holding on to this idolatry was so crucial for them, and now this messenger is sent and tells them, what? You have to get rid of all of it. What a difficult mission this is, subhanAllah. Now, one way that we can relate it to today, because sometimes people when, people, when you say, you know, oh, subhanAllah, there are people, there are certain forces that are against Islam even till today, people say, man, you have a conspiracy mind, you know, you're conspiracy minded, you're, you believe in fairy tales. Well, one simple way to put it, I think is very reasonable, is to say that the entire, when you look at the, the, the 1%, if you will, the richest people, their, their um, uh, uh, continuous prosperity depends upon what? Depends upon interest, right? Because their money makes money. Them being rich, they can keep, th th their wealth can keep perpetuating more wealth just by loaning and getting interest back. So, and that obviously has a negative long-term effects because when you have the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, it creates a big a wealth gap and then eventually the whole system collapses because people are like, well, let's just revolt. There's no reason to keep up the system. It's working against us. We have nothing to lose. And so this is a very dangerous system to uphold. And Islam, instead of watching the whole thing collapse, Islam says, let's get rid of the interest. And this is even mentioned in the Bible, but it seems that uh, the Jewish religion has ignored this and it seems that Christians have completely ignored it. It used to be called usury. And usury was a very bad word. Now they call it interest. Sounds like a great word, doesn't it? And there's lots of times that you find this, you know, back in the day, what was it? Fornication. Fornication is a very bad word. Oh, they're having an affair. Oh, that sounds nice, an affair. So you'll often find when evil things are very, you know, they, they have a certain harsh word and a harsh sound to them, you'll, you'll find that subhanAllah, the, the terminology changes. And classic example, uh, you know, homosexuality was used to be called sodomites. Very harsh term in the, in the Bible, the sodomites, right? Now what is it called? Gay. Gay means happy, tech from technically, right? It means happy. It's such a positive term. So you, you, find, you find the changing of language in order to make things more appealing. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. The point that I'm getting at is what? That this system today is built upon a similar sort of idol, the idol of money. And we as well are challenging that system. And that's why you find much resistance. Wallahu ta'ala adam. Anyway, just to relate it to our current context. So the Prophet ﷺ spreads his message, it gets popular amongst certain people, but there's also meets a lot of resistance. You fast forward 13 years and what happens? They move, they migrate from Mecca to Medina. And now Islam is established in a city where the Prophet ﷺ is the leader and Islam starts to uh, grow from there. But unfortunately, they keep on getting attacks. Why? Because the Quraysh were very angry at them, were very jealous of them and wanted to eradicate this message of Islam. We have the Battle of Badr, the Battle of uh, Uhud, the Battle of Khandaq. And you have these different battles that are taking place. And then finally, one year, the Prophet ﷺ has a dream and says, we have to go for Hajj. And then they go for Hajj, but they never get to complete it. They get stopped on the outskirts and they're told what? That we can make a treaty. And this is called what? This treaty is called? Salh of Hudaybiyyah, the Hudaybiyyah Treaty. That's right. So I know I'm going really quickly through the history, the whole of Islamic history here. But there's a reason and you'll see why. What happened at Hudaybiyah was very important. And it was so important, why? Because now instead of being treated like a bunch of criminals that have just, you know, ran away as a bunch of rogues and, uh, and outlaws, uh, uh, they're now being treated as a respected political body because that's what, you only make a treaty with somebody that you consider a legitimate uh, political uh, state. So what happens, subhanAllah, they get this treaty. This treaty is not in their favor, by the way. For instance, the people that leave Mecca and go to Medina, they have to be sent back. That's part of the treaty. But the people that are from Medina and go to Mecca, they're not sent back. They get to go. So you can see that the treaty was designed to be unfair to the Muslims. And so as the believers went back from Mecca to Medina, they were very angry and very upset. And they had a very negative feeling because they didn't make Hajj and the, and the treaty was against them. And they were so mad at the situation. What does Allah reveal? Allah reveals in, uh, uh, who knows the ayah? Who? No. Inna fatahna. Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina. This is in the Surah 48 verse 1. Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina. We have given you a great and clear victory. So now, the believers are thinking this is a victory. They're kind of confused about this. But obviously they believe the revelation. Nowadays, we can understand why this was such a great victory. Why the Hudaybiyah Treaty was such a great victory? For two reasons. I want you to imagine Mecca is the center. 
Mecca is, everybody respects all the tribes around Arabia, they all respect Mecca. And if Mecca is enemies with the Muslims, then they, even if they like Islam, they feel shy and they feel scared to even consider Islam. Now that the Prophet ﷺ has been given legitimacy by the center of Arabia, which is Mecca, now they're a, leg a legitimate group. On top of that, now they have a peace treaty, which means there's not going to be any more battles. So now instead of worrying about every next fight, they can now think about da'wah. And when they go and give da'wah, the people will say, hey, you're a legitimate, recognized uh, state. So now we can actually consider the religion seriously. So this was a great victory. Why? Because of peace and recognition. These two factors, now this is the important part. And I really, I'm going to harp on this later on, inshallah, but I want to give you a little introduction right now. The only reason it's such a victory is what? Because when you have peacetime and when you have recognition, the believers didn't just sit back and relax and just kick up their feet and do nothing. They used it as an opportunity to do what? To hustle and to work hard and to spread the message and to give da'wah and to call people to Islam. I'm going to come back to this point and relate it to us today. Because alhamdulillah, we today are living in times of peace. Alhamdulillah, you, know, you don't know, maybe tomorrow a war can break out. Excuse me. Maybe tomorrow a war can break out. Maybe tomorrow a disease could break out. You don't know. Maybe there could be an economic crash. Maybe there can be all sorts of problems in the next year or two. And so subhanAllah, we don't know how much peace and prosperity we, we're going to have. We just take it for granted. Oh, it's going to be forever. We're going to be comfortable. No, it, the econ economy can crash. There can be a war that breaks out. There can be a disease that breaks out. There can be a hundred things that happen. So we should be thinking to ourselves, this is peacetime. We have the opportunity. You can come to this masjid. There could be a halaqa of tajweed in one corner, a halaqa of, uh, of hibz al-Qur'an, of memorizing the Qur'an in one corner, aqidah classes, Arabic classes, fiqh, seerah, every tafsir. You could have all the different classes. This masjid could be full. Nobody's going to bother us. This is peacetime. Now is the time to do what? Take advantage. So we should ourselves ask this question, are we doing ourselves justice? Because the believers, the moment in the year 6, which was the 6 of Hijrah, the year 6 of Hijrah, that's when they got Salh al-Hudaybiyah. And it was at that time they said, let's work hard. And guess what they did? They worked so hard and they gained so many more people to Islam, brought so many more people into Islam, that two years later in the 8th year of Hijrah, what happens? This is what takes place. So you have the Quraysh and you have uh, uh, the Muslims. The Quraysh have allies. The Quraysh's allies, one, one tribe is a, a tribe named Banu Bakr, okay? And the Muslims have a, an ally called Banu Khuza'a. Khuza These two tribes have had a, a long-standing uh, feuds. They've been battling for a long time. They've been, they haven't been very, for whatever reason, you know, maybe a maybe hundred years ago, uh, one guy shot the, another guy's, uh, you know, camel by accident, and since then, their kids and their kids' kids and their kids' kids' kids have been just at war since forever. Anyway, we don't know the, I, I don't know. I don't know the historical reason for it. But the point is that these, these two groups had been feuding for a long time. The point is to say this, a certain group of Banu Khuza'a were close to the Haram. And Banu Bakr saw an opportunity. They went and attacked them along with some people from Quraysh. They, the people of Khuza'a tried to take refuge in the Haram, say this is a sanctified area, this holy land, you can't kill here. They didn't care, they killed anyway. Then some people from Khuza'a, they went to the Prophet and there's a long poem, it's very, it's very nice and you know, a very eloquent poem talking about, oh, you know, they betrayed us and they killed us and you said you're our ally, you have to protect us. Anyway, the, long, the, the point is what? That they asked the Prophet and said, you are, our, uh, you are our ally, you have to help us. And the Prophet said, yes, we are your ally and we are going to help you. The moment that this took place, Abu Sufyan was like, it was, Abu Sufyan is the leader of, of Quraysh. He's like, you fools, what have you done? We had a treaty with the Muslims, we had peace. Abu Sufyan was a lot more level-headed, a lot smarter than, let's say, Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, he didn't care what was happening, he just wanted to fight the Muslims. And he, that's how that's why he died. He died fighting the Muslims in the Battle of Badr. And even till his last breath, he was arrogant. Even to the point where he was injured, lying on the floor, and he's, he's in his last breath, and Ibn Mas'ud stands on top of him to uh, 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 execute him. What does he say to Ibn Mas'ud? He says, oh, look at you, you've, uh, or was it Mu'adh ibn Jabal? It might have been Mu'adh ibn He says, I can't remember which Sahabi. He says to the Sahabi, uh, oh, look at you, you've climbed so high. You know, he's talking about climbing onto his body. Look at you, a small guy like you climbed so high. He was arrogant to his last breath. And so that's how he died. Well, you know, and he was even asking, did we win or did they win? And he said, Allah and his messenger won, you Allah, you know, you enemy of Allah. So anyway, that's a long story short is what? That this man was bitter to the core, whereas Abu Sufyan was a lot more level-headed. He said, look, we have peace, let's keep it. They ruined it. 
This small group of people, they had this battle and it basically broke the treaty. Abu Sufyan immediately is frustrated and says, I'm going to Medina and I'm going to try to reclaim, I'm going to try to build back up this peace treaty. I want to reclaim it. I want to, you know, uh, make a new one. He travels to Medina. The first thing he does is he contacts his daughter. His daughter happens to be the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, Umm Habiba. Radiallahu anha. She is Umm al-Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers, Umm Habiba. He goes to the house of Umm Habiba looking for the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ isn't home at the time. So he goes, he's in the house, and he goes to sit down on a certain mat. And she grabs the mat and pulls it from underneath him. And then he looks, he's kind of confused. He says, Ya Bunaya, ma adri, araghibtu bi an hadha al firash, am araghibtu bihi anni. He says to his daughter, I don't know if you took this mat from underneath me because I'm too good for it or it's too good, too good for me. You know, which is it? Is, is this too you know, pathetic for me to sit on or is it that this is too good for me? And then she says, Ben, huwa firashu Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa anta rajulun mushrikun najis. <laughs> Subhanallah. She, harsh language. She says to her own father because she has iman in her heart and she loves uh, uh, Allah and His Messenger and she has distaste for the, di- for the enemies of Allah and His Messenger. She says, rather, it is the firash, it is the, uh, the, the mat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you are a mushrik najis. You are a, uh, basically a polytheist, uh, an unclean polytheist. Uh, and I would dislike it if you were to sit on the, the, the mat of the Prophet ﷺ. You're not clean enough for this mat, basically, she's saying. And then he says back to her, he says, Wallahi laqad asabaki ya bunaya ba'di shar. He says, something's wrong with you. I don't know. You know, something, something, something happened to you. I don't know what's wrong with you. So Abu Sufyan leaves the, that house and then looks for the Prophet ﷺ. He finds the Prophet ﷺ outside in Medina, tries to talk to him. The Prophet ﷺ just turns away, completely ignores him. What does that imply? This implies many things. It implies, look, when you break our treaty, you know, by the way, the Prophet didn't say any of this. This is me, me talking. He, the Prophet just didn't answer him. I'm just talking about what it implies. One thing is, when you break a treaty with us, it's not a joke. You can't just come back here and say, oops, sorry, let's make a new treaty and then break it again. Oh, let's make a third one. Let's make a fourth one. No, that's not how it works. Number one. Number two, you people two years ago made us a treaty that was really unfavorable. But guess what? We've been hustling for the past two years. And now we're a lot stronger. We don't have to take a bad treaty if we don't want one. Again, these are my words. I'm, I'm saying, I'm filling in this, my own interpretation of all this. And so now Abu Sufyan is just being ignored. Why? Because the Prophet is in, in a much more advantageous position and he's not to be stepped on and not to be you know, uh, uh, played games with. And so Abu Sufyan is getting really nervous and so he goes to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr gives him the same nothing, no response. He's trying to say, come on, we can redo it, we can make peace. No answer. He goes to Omar. Omar is not exactly, <laughs> Omar is very tough, right? So, uh, good luck, right? So what does is, what is Omar say? <laughs> Subhanallah, harsh words. He says, he says you, want me to make inter- you want me to intercede for you on behalf, uh, in front of the Prophet He says, Wallahi, if, I, if all I had was a speck, I would, make, I would fight you with it. If all I had was a little, little, little speck of nothing, I would make jahad tukum. I would fight against you people with this little speck. So basically saying, no, I, I really dislike you people. There's no way I'm going to help you. And then he goes to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And uh, he tries to, you know, he even speaks to Fatima. And says, you know, can you maybe Hassan or Hussein can say something. He's trying to go to the, you know, the, 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 the Prophet's family members and say, look, let's just make a peace treaty. Ali says something, subhanAllah, so beautiful. وَيْحَكَ يَا أَبَا سُفْيَانْ وَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ عَزَمَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم على أمر ما نستطيع أن نكلمه فيه Beautiful words. What does he say? He says, Woe to you, Abu Sufyan. Wallahi. When the Prophet ﷺ has made a decision, a firm decision upon something, it's not for us to now go and second guess and debate and talk about it. No, that's it. That's called following proper leadership. And... Allahu Akbar. And we need to think about this ourselves. And I'm going to get to all the different lessons. I have about 10 lessons we can learn from this uh, Fatih Mecca. Anyway, so the point is what? Everybody is saying the, the, the Prophet ﷺ made a decision. We're not going to debate him. We're not going to talk on behalf. Nothing. Then what does the Prophet ﷺ do? The Prophet ﷺ is very well aware that the Quraysh have scouts that pay attention to the movements of the Muslims. So he gathers a group of 80 men led by Abu Qatada ibn uh, Rab'i. Uh, to a place and sends them to a place called Adam or Idam. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. One of the two. What is the purpose of sending there? Just distraction. It's just a decoy. He's sending a group to think that we're busy with some battle, we're busy, we're busy with some expedition. The reality is what? They're getting, be- they're getting ready to go 
Fath Mecca. They're ready, getting ready to go to conquer Mecca. What happens in the meanwhile, so this, this diversion gets sent. Nobody's allowed to talk about the fact that they're actually getting ready to go to Mecca. One man does. A Sahabi named Hatib. Uh, uh, anhu. This man Hatib, he sent a letter with his, uh, a slave girl of his and said, go and give a letter to the Quraysh and let them know that the Muslims are coming to give them a heads up. This is a pure miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. He receives wahi. He receives revelation. He tells Ali and Zubair, go to so-and-so place, you're going to find a woman. She has a letter on her. Take that letter from her and bring her back to me. Pure miracle. There's no way, it's impossible for him to know. They go and they find, they go to that certain area, they find the woman. They say, give us the letter. She says, what letter? They say, listen. <laughs> they say, look, the Prophet ﷺ says you had a letter. If the Prophet said it, you have it. Now give us the letter or else we're actually going to remove your clothes. So subhanAllah, this brings up the fiqh issue. This is in Bukhari. This narration is mentioned by Ali himself. He talks about the whole narration. And many different scholars, they talk about the fiqh of how, you know, you're not supposed to touch a non-mahram, but in the case of war, there's exceptions, etc. Anyway, so they basically, they give this warning. She says, okay, okay, okay. And she takes out this uh, uh, letter from within the, she had these uh, thick braids. She removes this uh, uh, letter from the braids. And it basically reveals that, yes, he was indeed letting, giving them a heads up. So Hatib is brought to the Prophet ﷺ, and Ali and Zubair bring Hatib, and uh, Hatib says, before you make a judgment, before you make a decision, I want you to know that I have family in Mecca, and I don't have much affluence, and I don't have much position, and I was afraid for my family. I am a believer. I believe in Allah and His Messenger. And I didn't want to betray the Muslims, but I just wanted to take care of my family. And Omar says, let me take off his head, Ya Rasulullah, he's a munafiq, he's a hypocrite, let's just take, let's just take him out. <laughs> and the Prophet ﷺ says, no, he says, مَا يُدَرِيكَ لَعَلَّ اللَّهُ إِطَّلَعَ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَدْرٍ فَقَالَ إِعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ He says, no, Omar, perhaps it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looked at the people of Badr because he was somebody that fought, Hatib fought in Badr. Perhaps Allah looked at the people of Badr and said, do whatever you want, you know, you're forgiven. So subhanAllah, this goes to show the, the, the status of the people of Badr. Even if they do something like treason, that because of what great they did on that day, that subhanAllah, perhaps they are forgiven. The Prophet ﷺ makes his way to a valley that's right outside of Mecca, to a, a valley called Mar al-Zahran, a valley uh, uh, that is nearby Mecca. And Abu Sufyan is in Mecca, and him and Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas was a Muslim, but he was kind of keeping it under wraps. Him and Al-Abbas, they go on this large, uh, like sort of a, 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 a view to see the whole, all the Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ, subhanAllah, look at the strategy of the Prophet ﷺ. He tells all the believers, light a fire. Why? Because when you have... There was uh, uh, 10,000 yeah, 10, fires lit. So now Abu Sufyan, who is the leader of the enemies, he comes into this advantageous position where he can see from on top, and he sees 10,000 fires. And he knows, wow, this is intimidating. This is a huge number. We, we don't think we can fight. They're all ready, to, they're, uh, ready to, to do the conquest. I don't know if this is a good idea. So this goes to show, look at the, the, the genius of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to display big numbers. Very important lesson in this. Abu Sufyan al-Abbas says, listen, if they find you, you're the enemy. They're probably going to execute you. Maybe you should go talk to the Prophet Maybe you should go talk to him directly. And so uh, Abu Sufyan makes his way to the Prophet with al-Abbas anhu. And the Prophet sees him and says, ya Abu Sufyan, alam ya'ni laka an, an ta'lam an la ilaha illallah. He says, woe to you Abu Sufyan. Hasn't it been time that you say la ilaha illallah, that you recognize la ilaha illallah? Isn't it time that you recognize this? You have seen Islam go from... Nothing, just me calling the people how many years ago, let's say, I, I don't know the exact numbers, roughly 15 years ago, whatever it may be. You have seen me, actually more than that, uh, let's say almost 20, a little under 20 years ago. And now you see that we, all the Muslims are here coming back for the conquest of Mecca. Do you not see the miracle of Islam? Do you not see the power of Islam? Isn't it time that's an intelligent person like you? And so finally, yes, he does indeed embrace Islam. And it's very funny, Al-Abbas, this is in Abu Dawud. Al-Abbas has a nice quote. He says, Ya Rasulullah, inna Aba Sufyan rajulun yuhibbu hadha al-fakhr, faj'al lahu shay. He says, he says, Abu Sufyan is a man, he loves to be put in a top position, you know? Faj'al lahu shay. Give him something. Give him some sort of status. So the Prophet says, Naam, man dakhla dara Abi Sufyan, fahuwa amin. Wa man aghlaqa alayhi darahu, fahuwa amin. وَمَنْ دَخَلَ الْمَسْجِدَ فَهُوَ آمِنٍ He said, the Prophet ﷺ makes a declaration and says, whoever goes in the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. Whoever goes into their own house and locks the door, they're safe. Whoever goes to Masjid al-Haram, they're safe. So, if you can go to your own house, why do you have to go to Abu Sufyan's house? It's just to give him, it's just to say, 
you're a leader, you're, you're important. And this makes him feel good. This is another lesson, inshallah, we're going to talk about in a moment. I have a, I have a list of different uh, fawa'id and benefits that we can learn from these, this, this whole uh, Fath Mecca. The Muslims, the Muslims now move in. Actually, first Abu Sufyan goes to the Kaaba and makes an announcement. Everybody, the Muslims are here. They're too big of number. We can't fight them. Just go into your homes and, you know, be safe. And even his own wife. Who is the wife of Abu Sufyan? Hind. Hind, that's right. Hind, the one who hated Hamza so much, right? We know the story of Hamza and, and SubhanAllah. So Hind, what does she do? She grabs him by the mustache and says, you're a coward, and starts, starts making fun of him. Abu Sufyan doesn't care. He's like, look, I'm the leader of the people. I have to take care of my people. He's like, look, go into your homes. It's over. The jig is up. There's too many of them. They're right outside. So the Muslims enter into Mecca. How do they do it? Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, radiallahu anhu, he had the flag, he was the flag bearer for the Ansar, for the people of uh, Medina. Unfortunately, he said words where he said, today we'll witness a great fight, you cannot take sanctuary in the Kaaba. He basically said, we're going to slaughter you people. And the Prophet hurt, uh, hurt, found out about this and said, we're going to have to switch you with your son Qais. So, and why? Because the Prophet was trying to maintain an attitude and an atmosphere of peace. This was the attempt. We're not here to make a huge slaughter today. And so one leader said fighting words and they said, okay, instead of just taking it away from you, I'm going to give the honor to your son. So it's still an honor for you, but it can't be you because, you know, that's going to have the wrong, send the wrong message essentially. That's the flag of the Ansar. Then you had the right flank of Khalid bin Walid. There was some narrations that certain people tried to resist him. And so Khalid bin Walid and his army or his, his flank they fought back and, and certain people were executed. But this was only in self-defense and it was very few. It was just to, to, to quell a very small few, uh, little rebellion. The left flank was led, led by uh, Az-Zubair ibn Awam and then the infantry was led by uh, Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu. So you have all these groups coming in. They come inside of Mecca. Almost no resistance whatsoever. They set up a tent for the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu goes in, spends a little bit of time, short time in the tent and then comes out, and the first thing the Prophet ﷺ does as, first of all, when he comes in, he's in sajda. On his, uh, on his animal, on his ride, he is in sajda. Complete humility. Not boasting, not arrogant, not proud. Look at me, I won the day. No. Pure humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he goes around the Kaaba first thing, destroy the idols. Remember we said Ibrahim's mission was what? Oh Allah, send a messenger that will clean up the Kaaba. The first thing that he has an opportunity is to establish and... and uh, uh, return the Kaaba to its original uh, intent, which is Tawheed and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he's destroying the idols while saying, saying the ayah in Surah Isra that uh, the truth has come and falsehood perishes, as uh, indeed uh, falsehood by its very nature is ever bound to depart and to, and to disappear. There is uh, a narration that the Prophet and then stood up and gave his address. He said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah wahda, wa sadaqa wa'da, wa nasara abda, wa hazam al ahzaba wahda. We all know this. Why? Because in a few days, Eid. And we're going to be saying the same words, inshallah. When you hear these words on Eid, you can remember where it came from. The Prophet ﷺ would say this whenever he would come back from any battle. This was a, a continuous thing that he would say when he came back from battle. But this is especially important at Fath al Mecca. Because subhanAllah, what does it mean? Allahu Akbar, God is the, Allah is the greatest three times. La ilaha illallah, there is no deity but Allah, the one, wahda. Sadaqa wa'da, he is truthful to his promise. Wa nasara abda, and he gave victory to his slave, the, the Prophet ﷺ. Wa hazam al ahzaba wahda, and he destroyed these confederates, all these different groups that came against me. Allah destroyed these confederates. He made a speech, and I can't go into detail because time is running short. He went into uh, some details about um, uh, uh, money that was owed to people. And debts. He went to some details as well, talking about the, the, the um, uh, blood money. If somebody gets killed, then what is the recompense or what is the, the basically the um, the uh, punishment for, for, for murder? So, Allah, so the Prophet ﷺ is establishing the basics: oneness of Allah, dealing with money issues, dealing with the sanctity of life. And then the Prophet ﷺ says something beautiful. Deals with a very important topic, which is racism and classism, right? And he says, "What? Ya ma'ashar Quraysh, inna Allah qad adhaba ankum." Subhanallah, beautiful words. So simple. He says, O Quraysh, Allah has abolished from you all pride of jahiliya in your ancestry. Because all men are from Adam and Adam is from the dirt. Get over yourself. You're literally from dirt. This whole, I'm from this tribe, I'm from that tribe, I'm this color, I'm that color. What a con. 
What an unbelievable con. You really think you're better than somebody uh, because of a color? Uh, can you imagine how, uh, you know, imagine, I, I don't know if I've given this analogy in this message before. If I haven't, I'll, I'll mention it. Imagine if somebody said, I'm a mechanic. I've spent many years, I, I study cars, I, I know cars in and out. He looks at two cars that he's never seen before. He says, oh, this one's the good one, this one's the bad one. Why? Well, this one's blue and this one's red. Wait, what? I'm sorry, did you, just, did you just say that this one's blue so it's good and this one's red so it's bad? Yeah. And you're a mechanic. You don't want to pop the hood. You don't want to ask about the year. You don't want to talk about any, you don't want to ask any questions about the, the car itself. You're telling me you know just because of the color? I'm sorry to say you're an embarrassment to mechanics. You know nothing about cars, right? That's, that's how embarrassing it is. You're telling me the color tells you everything, the color tells you nothing. That obviously means you know nothing about cars. So the same, it's a small, cute analogy, but it still works. Then the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ recites the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa says, Ya ayyuha nasu inna khadaqnaakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnaakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum. That, uh, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female, and made you people and tribes, uh, peoples and tribes, that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble amongst you is the one who has the most taqwa. The only fadl, the only way that one can be over the other is just with piety. How close you are with Allah, that's your rank, nothing else. And then, subhanAllah, the Prophet says the most beautiful thing. He says, ثُمَّ قَالْ يَا مَعْشَرْ قُرَيْشِ مَا تُرَوْنَ أَنِّي فَاعِلٌ فِيكُمْ He says, oh Quraysh, what do you think I should do with you today? Now imagine, Quraysh have been fighting him for no reason for so many years. So many years. How many years? SubhanAllah, almost, almost 20 years. Almost 20 years just fighting the Prophet for what? Just because he says, لا إله إلا الله. For no reason whatsoever. Killing people, trying to assassination attempts, so on and so forth. Clearly, what they deserve is what execution. That's it. It's done. The game is over. So, they, then the, so the Prophet Sallallahu says, "What do you think I should do with you today?" What do they say? They say, "Khairan, akhun karim, ibn akhin karim." <laughs> they say you should do good to us because you're a noble brother and the son of a noble brother. Oh, please, you're a noble brother. Come on, we love you. <laughs> yeah, you love me so much. You're trying to kill me for the past how many years? So, Subhanallah. So the Prophet Sallallahu says. Go because you are all set free. This is the mercy of the Prophet He did not do a big slaughter even though he could have. And in some narrations he mentions, Which ayah is this? Who knows? Who's, who's, whose quote is that? Yusuf salam. that's the one. He quotes Yusuf salam. Why? Because, because when in the year of grief, when the Prophet many years ago was at his worst point in life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed him the story of Yusuf to say, look, you weren't the only person to go through hard times. Look at, you got kicked out of, you're getting kicked out, you're gonna be kicked out of Mecca, guess what? You're gonna be kicked out of Mecca by your own family. Yusuf alayhi salam was kicked out of his, home, his own home as well by his own family. And because of his incredible patience and because of how uh, his beautiful patience, he was able to get into a position that was advantageous over his own brothers. And so his brothers had to come back to him and then ask him for forgiveness. And then he forgave them. This was all an ishara. This is all an indication or a, a, a foreshadowing, if you will. This is Allah's divine foreshadowing saying what? You one day will be kicked out. You one day will get the upper hand. You one day will have these people come back to you asking for forgiveness. And you will say the same words as Yusuf. لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. There's no blame on you today. You're forgiven. Allah is, for, Allah is forgiving, don't worry about it, I let it go. SubhanAllah, look at how these ayat were revealed back then, and how they played out in history, and how they were given to the Prophet ﷺ just to remind him to go on, be patient. You have a brother, his name is Yusuf, he went through the same thing just like you. SubhanAllah, beautiful. So, and then what does the Prophet ﷺ do? He takes Bilal, somebody who is considered slave, puts him on top of the Kaaba, Allahu Akbar. On top of the standing, with his feet, standing on top of the Kaaba. Calls Ashadu la ilaha illallah, Ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. Calls the adhan. So Subhanallah, this is the story of uh, Fath Mecca. I didn't want to just say Fath Mecca happened and then let's get into the surah. I had to give this whole background about Ibrahim alayhi salam, about the struggle of spreading Islam, about going to Medina and then having Sal uh, Salh Hudaybiyah, where Allah says that you do have indeed a victory coming up. The Fath is coming, and then of course Ida ja Nasrullahi wal Fath. This is when this surah begins. So, inshallah, we're going to get into that, the surah itself, word for word, and we're going to get into a detailed explanation in two weeks, inshallah. Next week is Eid. Uh, I just want to mention uh, several very important uh, uh, lessons. One, Hudaybiyah did not favor the Muslims, but they made the most of it. Are we taking advantage of our time today? We have freedom, we have comfort, we can spread this deen in every direction. Nobody's going to stop us. Alhamdulillah, we have the freedom to do that. 
What are we doing with the free time, with the, with the abilities that we have? We need to take advantage so that when hard times do show up, we're ready for them. It just took two years and then hard times came back, right? It happened in year six, the Hudaybiyah, the treaty, and then it was broken two years later. But just in those two years, they took advantage of that time so much so that they were like, that's okay. We had an opportunity when we took it and now we're in such a strong position. We have to think smart. We got to be smart like this. As Muslims, we have to uh, spread the deen and, uh, and make sure that we are more established as a Muslim community. Okay, next point is that the Muslims, they protect their allies. Muslims should be reliable that they protect their allies. We should follow up with our converts. People embrace Islam. A lesson for us today, when people embrace Islam, we say, MashaAllah, you're my brother. Really, I'm your brother? Months go by, you never talk to the person, you never call him, you never follow up. Are you really treating him like a brother? When the Prophet says, you are my ally, he treats them like an ally. He's there for them. So if we're going to say, MashaAllah, someone takbir, Allahu Akbar, they embrace Islam, we give them a big hug, all this, and then two minutes later, we never hear from them again. That's not being true to your uh, word. When we say, you are my brother now, we should be true to that and always follow up with our brothers and sisters who embrace Islam. Uh, next is, Muslims will not be stepped on. Muslims will, uh, uh, you know, are not people to be, you know, walk, uh, taken advantage of. Number four is that obedience, true obedience creates amazing results. What I mean by this is that if you have leadership, and alhamdulillah you do have great leadership in this masjid and many masajid. So instead of, the imam makes the decision. Okay, we made a decision. We had shura, we talked about it, we made a decision. Five minutes later, oh, somebody came up with another idea. Let's change the idea. And then another five minutes later, oh, somebody came up with another idea. Let's change it. Let's debate about it. Let's keep going back, forth, back, forth. Eventually, you just run in circles. You never get anywhere. This is no good. Look at how the believers acted with the Prophet ﷺ. They made shura. They had a decision. They make the decision. That's it. The Prophet ﷺ has made a decision. Look at the words of Ali. We have no ability. We can't talk about it now. Done. The decision is made. So we have to learn to talk about an issue, decide, and stick to the plan. We have to think two, three steps ahead like the Prophet ﷺ did when he sent the expedition to, to make a diversion. We have to have long-term strategies. We have to predict what different people will do and how we should react, uh, how we should plan out uh, the reactions of various people that may oppose or may cause problems. Uh, we look at that, we see the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ and the miraculous, uh, one of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ in the story of Haltib. And so we should be merciful to our brothers. If they make a mistake, okay, be merciful with them. Why? Because we know that deep down in their hearts they're believers, but sometimes they have weaknesses. We should be able to show our strength. This is a very big, important lesson. The Prophet made sure that 10,000 fires were lit to show the strength, because when you show strength, people become attracted to Islam. And I can say this with confidence, because I've seen at different conferences like ICNA or ISNA or RIS, you guys have heard of conferences like this? Have you ever, if you've ever been to one, I'm sure you've noticed that a lot of people take shahada, a lot of people say, you know, accept Islam. And you wonder, why are they all embracing Islam today? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that a lot of people, they like the theory of Islam, they like the idea of Islam, and they're right on the edge, they want to embrace, but they're still a little hesitant. When they see Muslims come out in big numbers, then that gives them the confidence, okay, now I'm going to take the final step. Because there's a difference between knowing something in theory and seeing it in practice. The Qur'an is a book. Right? It's theory. Right? It, it, words, ideas. Same thing, the Qur'an, the Sunnah, the whole deen is theory. When Muslims live that deen, that's the practice. So you have to have both. You can't just give the theory and expect people to accept. They'll be convinced a certain amount. But then the next amount is to show strength. And that's what we need to do in various times. Like having, con We should have a, a unified Eid. By the way, I'm sure Imam Fatin mentioned that on, uh, mashallah, we, Brother Ahmed and Brother Hanafi, they know very well, we were all at the meeting together, that we're having the meeting, uh, we're having the uh, celebration, the citywide uh, Eid celebration on Wednesday. Inshallah, you can get the details as to when and where uh, after, inshallah ta'ala. Next lesson is honoring the leaders. Make sure you don't create uh, enemies for yourself for absolutely no reason. When even if somebody's your, your enemy, but he's a leader, treat him like a leader. Show him a, a certain amount of respect because that way you win people's favor and you don't create unnecessary enemies uh, for no reason. And a uh, final point is what? That look at the priorities. Breaking the idols, establishing tawheed. Making sure settling, uh, dealing with the settling of debts, the sanctity of life, dealing with racism, dealing with classism, and uh, dealing with, and look at the theme of forgiveness. All of you are forgiven. These are the fundamentals of this deen, subhanAllah, that make sure that the Prophet made sure all of these ideas were well in place on the day of the conquest of Mecca. So, uh, so I apologize if I went a little bit over time, but Alhamdulillah, I think it was very important that we uh, revisit this amazing conquest, understand and appreciate how incredible of a uh, victory it was, 
And inshallah, in two weeks, we will be able to actually get into the surah itself that Allah describes uh, describes this, this, this conquest and has certain things to say about it, which we will, we will explore, inshallah, uh, in two weeks. If anybody has any comments, questions, I always really appreciate it, alhamdulillah, when people uh, bring, uh, uh, you know, wonderful commentary and uh, insight, whether a certain ayah of the Qur'an, a hadith, a... Anybody wants to... Okay, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawlah amma ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh How's everybody doing? Good, alhamdulillah, fantastic So, uh, alhamdulillah, last week was Eid, the week before that we did the story of Fath al-Makkah as an introduction so that everybody could uh, situate themselves and understand exactly uh, the importance of this surah إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ So now, inshallah, we're going to get into the text of it, inshallah ta'ala. Now that we understand just how monumental Fath al-Makkah was, we can appreciate it more and get into the actual surah itself. This is the 110th surah of the Mus'haf. It has three verses and it only has 19 words. It's a very short surah. Uh, it is known as Surah al-Nasr, that is its most popular name. In some narrations, it also goes by the name of Surah al-Fath, but that's a little bit confusing because Surah al-Fath is Surah, surah 48. So the main, but you can see why it would be called that because إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ So sometimes people call it Fatih. But uh, another name for this surah, which I think is uh, quite powerful, is the name Surah At-Tawdi'ah. Surah At-Tawdi'ah. What does a wida' or wada' mean? Yeah, well, what is a wada' Yeah, saying bye-bye. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a farewell. So Surah At-Tawdi'ah means the surah of saying farewell. And the idea is that in this surah there is three things. There is an ishara, there is a bishara, and there is an amr. The uh, bishara means the good news. The good news is of Fath Mecca. The ishara, or the indication, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, is he's reaching the completion of his, uh, of his uh, uh, mission, and therefore he's going to return back to his Lord. And the uh, amr, the command, is to uh, praise Allah, glorify Allah, make, ask Allah for forgiveness, and then uh, that's how you uh, close things. That's how you finish up. That's how you want to conclude. Uh, so what's interesting is that in terms of the, 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 the context of the, uh, the textual context or the uh, textual situation, you have that this surah is 110, before it you have uh, surah kafirun and, bef- and after it surah tabat yada abi lahab wa tab, surah lahab, right? So what's interesting about this is that kafirun was revealed at the beginning of the mission of the Prophet So near the beginning of the mission of the Prophet you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, listen, this is the way it's going to be. Division. There's going to be believers and disbelievers. Lakum dinukum waliyadin. You have your way, I have my way. That's the way it is. We're going to divide each other. Then all the way near the end of the life of the Prophet you have this declaration that the believers have indeed uh, are victorious and that they have taken back Mecca and now it is becoming the center of Tawheed as it originally was supposed to be. And then after that you have the fate of uh, Abu Lahab, which is representative of all the disbelievers, everybody who opposes Islam, what happens eventually that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to get them in the end. So what's fascinating about this is that at the top of it, you, it's like a, you can look at it as a triangle. At the top, Surah Kafirun is dividing believers and disbelievers. And in terms of the believers, you find their fate is mentioned in Surah Al-Nasr, that they are going to have victory. And Surah Tabat Yada is the fate of the disbelievers. Does everybody understand this? Surah Kafirun divides them both, and then you have the two parties. So that's the one way you can look at this uh, in terms of the three surahs and why they are in this order that they are. And it's really important that we appreciate all these nuances of why the ayat are the way they are, why the surahs are organized the way they are, and to see the wisdom within. Now, this is a surah that describes the inevitable victory of Islam, that Allah is... Uh, that Allah is going to give help and victory to the believers. There are many ayat of the Quran that talk about the inevitable victory of Islam. Just to give you a few, who are the Arsala Rasula who build Huda within the Hak, Liul Hirahu Aladin Kulih, Walla Kari Hal Mushrikun. Allah says, It is He, Allah, who sent His Messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to make it manifest over all other religions, to make sure that it will vanquish and it will con- uh, conquer and it will be, uh, prove its. It's greatness over all other religions, even if the mushrikeen, those who associate with Allah, even if they hate it. Whether you like it or not, that's what's going to happen. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقْ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُقَ Allah says in Surah Isra, and say that the truth has come and falsehood has departed, because indeed falsehood by its very nature is ever bound to depart. Allah says, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَا أَغْلِبَنَّ أَنَا وَرُسُلِي إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَوِيٌ عَزِيزٌ Allah says, Allah has decreed it that I will overcome me and my messengers. That of a surety, there is no doubt. 
that I, well, uh, that Allah and my messengers, we will be the ones who overcome and are uh, basically the winners in the end. Indeed, Allah is powerful and exalted, exalted in might. Allah says many ayat that uh, that indeed uh, this earth will be inherited by my righteous servants. This is ayah in Surah uh, 21, which is Surah Anbiya. And Allah also, so many, many different ayat uh, uh, of this nature. So the reason I go over all these ayat to talk about this is because I want you to know that over and over again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that this deen will prevail. And the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these ayat at a time when the Prophet was ridiculed, he was alone in his da'wah, and even his context, he was in the Arabian Peninsula, the whole peninsula was looked at as like nothing in, in, term, in terms of the uh, global scheme of things. You know, the, the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire and even, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, cultures like the Chinese culture in, in India and so on and so forth, very advanced cultures. The Arab, the Arab Peninsula was considered a backwater, you know, these people are like nothing. They're not even worth conquering. There's nothing there. There's nothing to benefit from. Whether it be uh, uh, material, there, were, there was no oil at that time, right? They didn't know what was underneath. So there was no, there was no uh, you know, material resources, right? There was no particular, let's say, knowledge or culture, nothing. There was nothing there to get. And so you can imagine that at a time like that, to say that this Islam, which is even opposed in that context, I mean, imagine, it's even hated and opposed in that context, and that context is considered nothing, for that religion to spread all over the world, and for us to be talking about it here, and for Muslims to comfortably say that we make up, what is it, one, well, somewhere between one-fifth and one-fourth of the human population, and on top of that, they say that it's going to overtake uh, uh, Christianity in a number of years, not too many years. So, subhanAllah, one after the other, you look at all this and you think, this is truly the manifestation of Allah's decree this is this is the promise coming true and it's not like it was a small promise so when you look at it from that perspective and you realize that the promise has pretty much come true now we're just looking at the final throws we're just looking at the last little bit and uh, you know the, the, the final expansion of people learning about and, and embracing Islam you have to ask yourself and we have to all ask ourselves a very important question and that question is how much do I want to be part of it because this train is going to go into the station it's already gone it's already moving so whether it's you that gets part of that ajr or whether it is somebody else that is going to do the job of conveying this deen and teaching this deen and spreading this, this light, whether it's you or somebody else, the fact is it's going to get done. The question is how much do you want to take from this? How much do you want the credit to be yours? That's a very, very important question we need to all ask ourselves. This surah is considered a gift to the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because, and a comfort to the Prophet ﷺ, because the Prophet ﷺ worried about people embracing Islam more than anybody. And this is, again, a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that I think gets overlooked a lot. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, it's, it's very important to practice all of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Like, it's a beautiful thing to be a person who tries to dress sunnah, tries to, uh, you know, whether it be your uh, miswak, whether it be uh, entering your, uh, uh, with the right foot into the masjid, all of these sunnah are wonderful. And I'm not trying to belittle any of them. But sometimes it scares me when people emphasize, emphasize external sunan and then completely neglect internal sunan. What do I mean by this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ أَلَّا يَكُونُ مُؤْمِنِينَ It's almost as if you're going to kill yourself with grief, O Muhammad. You're going to kill yourself with grief uh, because they will not become believers. Because these people are not accepting Islam. So if you want to talk about sunnah, think about it from the external as well as internal perspective. And think to yourself, you know what's a very important sunnah? Every time I go to school or I go to work or I look at my neighbors, I think to myself, I wish I could convey guidance to them. I hope they embrace Islam. I hope I'm a positive influence. I hope I can have a good impact on them. And this should be like something that's boiling inside of you, some sort of a turmoil that you have this concern. And if you feel like, man, I'm stressing out uh, about this a lot. I feel like it's actually like giving me heartburn. It's, it's, it's bothering me. I can't sleep. If you get that feeling inside of you, then tell yourself, Alhamdulillah, I'm, a, I'm upon the sunnah. It, the sunnah is not just external things. The sunnah is also that feeling deep inside where you want people to embrace Islam. You want people to see the light of Islam. And so this surah is a gift to the Prophet ﷺ saying, you wanted this so badly. You wanted to see the victory and now here it is. Here's the victory that you wanted. Another important ayah that we find in surah Hadid, verse number 10. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا لَكُمْ أَلَّا تُنْفِقُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلِلَّهِ مِرَاثُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ What is wrong with you that you do not spend in the cause of Allah while to Allah belongs the inheritance of the heavens and the earth? And then this is a very key point. Allah says what? لَا يَسْتَوِي مِنْكُمْ مَنْ أَنْفَقَ مِنْ قَبْلِ الْفَتْحِ وَقَاتَلُ أُولَئِكَ أَعْظَمُ دَرَجَةً مِنَ الَّذِينَ أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ بَعْدُ وَقَاتَلُوا 
SubhanAllah, this is an ayah, I think about this quite often to be honest with you. This is an ayah that I think it really deserves our attention. Allah says, why don't you spend fi sabilillah? And then Allah says right after that, not equal among you are those who spent before the conquest of Mecca, before the Fath, as, as compared to those who spent and fought afterwards. So spending fi sabilillah before and fighting before Fath Mecca is not the same as afterwards. And then Allah says uh, that in both of them there is good. So what is this, what is this implying? That Fath Mecca was a pivotal point, was a turning point, that it was Umm al-Qura, it was the biggest city. And another important thing to remember about why it's so important is because this is a place that it has divine protection, okay? The Arabs still remember when, who was it that came with all the elephants? What was his name? Abraha. Abraha. Abraha came to destroy the Kaaba. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously sent flocks of birds that dropped these large stones. And I, if you guys want to get a visual, I think, wallah alam, a good idea is to watch those videos of hail. Have you guys ever seen those really big balls of hail that fall down and people take videos of it? And then you see the car windows get smashed up and the house gets smashed up. I mean, those are about the size of a fist, right? Roughly speaking. So imagine if you have these birds that are carrying rocks of, let's say, comparably roughly the same size and they're way up high and they're dropping them and they're coming down like that hail does. You know, and that's just, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَىٰ Allah has the highest of examples. But just to give a visual idea. I mean, when, if you watch those videos, you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so subhanAllah, this, this army got completely destroyed and all the Arabs knew that, look, this is Allah's house. And so if somebody tries to come into it and take it over, then if Allah doesn't approve of them, who knows, maybe a hurricane will come, maybe uh, the earth is going to swallow them up, maybe, I don't know, maybe a flood is going to wash them away, who knows, but some, they, you know, Allah's not going to let it happen. So the Arabs were very pensive, they were sitting back and watching and saying, seeing what's going to happen between the Quraysh and Muhammad. Muhammad saying that he is the, you know, he's following the legacy of Ibrahim and he wants that Kaaba. You know, he wants to re return it to Tawheed. Let's see what's going to happen. They're all sitting and waiting. And then when finally Fath Mecca happens, all of them, they start coming in, in big numbers. Why? Because they're like, this is proof that not only did they take it over, but they took it over peacefully. Usually you'd think that there's going to be a fight. But the fact that there was no fight whatsoever, no commotion whatsoever, this must be an indication that Allah is pleased with this uh, man and that he is indeed a messenger of Allah. So that's why they came in droves. The point that I'm trying to get at though, I, I kind of diver, diverged a little. The point that I want to drive at is what? That Allah is saying that before the Fath Mecca, it was very difficult because the Muslims were looked at as like a fringe group. After Fath Mecca, now it's established in the land. Now these are like the, you know, the, 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 the main group, this, the, the central uh, religion, if you will. So joining is no problem. So if you fought or spent money when it was really difficult, you get more ajr, you have a higher degree than the one who does afterwards, but both of them have good. Now I want to give an example. Us today, we don't have to deal, Mecca is Mecca, alhamdulillah, we don't have to deal with that anymore. But my point is this, let's say for example, this masjid has a project. You're going to have some people in the community saying, I don't know, I didn't show up for the meeting, I don't know if it's a good idea, no, I don't really, you know, my, my money's tight right now, I don't have any time, excuse, excuse, this, that, this, that, and the other. And nobody wants to participate. Then guess what happens? A few core people, they are so dedicated, they work hard, they give everything they can, and then the project is up and running. And then they have a launch date, and they invite everybody, and they're giving food, and they're saying, you know, they have a big banner that says, you know, uh, mission accomplished, or whatever it says, right? And everybody's really happy. Guess what happens? All those people that were saying, no, 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 they all show up for the party. And they're all saying, yeah, yeah, you know, I like this idea right from the beginning, you know. And they want to get in there with the picture, and they want to make sure that they send the picture to all their friends and say, look at what my community did. This is what we did. We did. What do you mean we? You were the guy saying, you were the guy saying, oh no, I don't have time, and it's too difficult. I don't think it's a good idea. Maybe we should do something else. Except you were the guy who had all the excuses in the world. And now that it's done, you want to jump on board, jump on the bandwagon, and, and party with everybody else. Now look, I'm not saying it's bad. It's not evil, because at the end of the day, if you support at the beginning or at the end, you're still supporting, right? But when that crucial moment is there, be the type of person that says, I want to help when it matters, when it counts. You see, there are certain people that have projects for this community that are just budding. They're just at the initial stages. You want to be that first, those first ones. Why? Because they get the special ajr. They get it when nobody else believed in it. They were the ones that got it. They get the ajr when everybody else was a naysayer. You don't want to be the naysayer, you want to be the one who has a positive attitude. So this ayah, 
really reflects that fact. And I really hope that inshallah all of us embody this and take this lesson into our community, inshallah, whatever's happening in this masjid and other masajid for that matter. Any projects that are taking place in our community. It's also important to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Baqarah that do you think that you're going to enter paradise while such, uh, like the people before you, they had to pass through so many tests, right? And then Allah says, مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَأْسَاءُ وَالضَّرَّاءُ وَزُلْزِلُوا that those people before you, what did they have to go through? They were touched by ba'sa, they were touched by poverty, they were touched by hardship, and they were shaken. So this can be interpreted in multiple ways. But the idea is to say what? That you can't just say, I'm a believer, I want good things to happen, and then everything is made easy for you. If Allah wanted to do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an instant can just make everybody a believer and everybody just... No, the idea is life is a test. So when you say, I want to do something good, Allah is going to put you through difficulty. Allah is going to say, really? You want to do good, you want to strive for, for perfection, you want to see ihsan, you want to really have a positive effect, okay, well, you're going to have a little bit of hardship. Maybe it's going to test your money. Maybe it's even going to shake you in your faith. Maybe you're going to get sick. Maybe you're going to get threatened. Maybe you're going to get injured. Maybe something tough is going to happen to you. I'm going to see how serious you are. Because there are some people that say, I want to do good. The moment they get a little scratch, oh, they throw in everything. That's it, I'm done. I thought Islam was going to give me a bunch of blessings and Allah was going to start working for me and start giving me everything I wanted. That's the way I expected Islam to be. I accept Islam, it's like I'm doing God a favor. Hey God, now you work, now do whatever I want. I accepted Islam. I did you a favor, now you work for me. A'udhu Billah, this is a terrible attitude. We have to recognize that we accept Islam because we're seeking Allah, we're seeking the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still going to test us. And we have to be okay with that. And we have to prove to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even through the testing, I'm not going to let go. I might have my ups and downs, but at the end of the day, I'm going to be steadfast and strong. Ida, what does Ida mean? That's all the introduction. What does the word Ida mean? It means if or when. Ida ja'a is to come. Atta, also in Arabic, means to come. What is the difference between ja'a and atta? Does anybody know? Ja'a, to come. If I say jitu ilayka, it means I came to you. If I say ataytuka, it means I came to you. What is the difference? No, there's a difference. In Arabic, there's no such thing as synonyms. In Arabic, there's always a flavor. There's always something. There's always some little, uh, you know, uh, some difference. Okay, so the difference is, atta is when something comes that's easy to come. Hal ataka hadith al Did the news, news is just news. It's not uh, the news of the judgment day, of ghashia, of this overwhelming event, of this big covering event. Did the news come to you? News is easy to come to you. Just, you know, somebody talking. Someone can send you a text message. Easy. So Allah uses atta. هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ الْغَاشِيَةِ Did this hadith, did the news of Ghashia come to you? But whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions جَاءَ it's something big and heavy. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ is a big deal. So نَصْر is help. But مُسَاعَدَ is also help. If I say أَنَا مُسَاعِد that means I'm a helper. If I say أَنَا نَاصِر by the way my name is Nasir so it's just interesting. If I say my name is Nasir that means I'm a helper. If I say I'm a Musa'id that means I'm a helper. What's the difference? Uh, Arabic, Arabic, Arabic. There's no, there's no pure synonyms in Arabic. There's always going to be a flavor. Anybody? Know? The size. Of one could be. That was the last one. Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, it's good. No, it's actually it has to do with it. Kind of it, uh, the way I like to think about it is it has to do with a fight. So what I mean by this is what if somebody needs help with the dishes, they're not going to say yeah unsurni, help me with the dishes. Nasr is for like no, there's a, there's there's an enemy outside and they all want they want to they want this a showdown, you know. So you call up your friends, you're like, yo, there's something's going to happen in a few, you know, in an hour from now, I need your help. You know, that, it's that type of a help. It's like the type of like intense help, like a battle type of help. So Nasr is to give victory when there is something dangerous at hand. But if you're just helping somebody with, let's say, I don't know, vacuuming the room or washing the dishes or organizing this and that, you don't call that Nasr. You call that Musa'ada. It's just help. Yeah, help me with this, help me with that. Right? So in this sense, when, so my name is Nasr, so even though I, I try to help out with the dishes, I do. <laughs> but uh, but my, Nasr implies that I'm going to help you, not for necessarily the little things. Inshallah, I will help you with the little things. But also with the big things. That's what's important. The reason why I say all this is to say what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that this is the victory. Allah is giving help in a very intense moment. Ja'a Nasrullah. And this is important too. When something is connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, well, excuse me, when something it has an idafa, like a, a, a pairing, what that implies, it gives you an idea of how big it is. So for instance, let's say nar. Nar means fire. If I say the fire of a match, now you're thinking of a small fire. The fire of a campfire, bigger. 
The fire of a nuclear bomb, big. The fire of the sun, huge. If I say, Narullah, the fire of Allah, Narullah al muqadah now you can't even imagine. Right? When Allah talks about hellfire, Allah says, uh, puts idafa and connects it to His own name. Narullah, the fire of Allah. So that makes it so big that you can't even, you can't even fathom. So in the same way, if I said Nasru, you know, Nasru Fulan, you know, Nasru Qawmin, Nasru, you know, the, the, the help of a people, or the help of a person. If I say Nasru whoever, you might think of it as a, relative to its size, relative to how big the group was, etc. If I say the help of Allah, now how great is it? Now this is what's so amazing. Usually when we think of a victory against an enemy, if, you know, you guys watch movies, I'm sure, uh, you know, when the, when the good guy beats up 10 bad guys, you know, it's considered a big victory. If he beats up 100 bad guys, it's a really huge victory, right? And the more bad guys he beats up and the more bodies that are laying on the floor, you think of it bigger and bigger and bigger. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connects it with his own name and says it's the greatest victory, no bodies. Isn't that amazing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the greatest victory was a victory of peace. The greatest victory was walking in and there was no violence. You guys, getting, you guys getting my point? So when we think of the great, great victory, we think of, you know, slashing through the enemies and oh, Rambo shooting and, you know, they're all, all the bodies are flying, etc. No, this is not the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah says the greatest, Nasrullah, the greatest of victories, and then associates it with a victory that was peaceful. That's amazing. Nasrullahi wal, and this is, why is it the Nasr of Allah, what, what, what makes it so great? Think about this, a few years prior, the Prophet ﷺ was going around from group, going to group to group, going to this tribe and going to that tribe and trying to invite them to Islam. Now, he's not going to anybody. The groups are coming to him. يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا They're يَدْخُلُ دَخَلَ means to enter. يَدْخُلُونَ They are entering fi in دين الله in the religion of Allah, أَفْوَاجًا Group after group. A fawj is one group, afwaj are groups. So subhanAllah, he was going from one group to the next, now the groups are coming to him. This is why it is the great victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why does Allah then say al-fatih? Well, one reason is because, what does uh, fatih mean? What does the verb fatih mean? Anybody know? To open, to open, that's right. So why, why is a military victory called a fatih? Because a military victory opens up land. When you conquer land, now it opens up to you, you can go and travel there comfortably. That's why they would call a military victory a fatih. Um, so, what's interesting is that Allah does not say إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَفَتْحُ مَكَّةِ Allah doesn't say when the opening of Mecca comes. Why, why Al-Fatih? Two explanations. The reason Allah said the victory, doesn't say more detail, not the victory of this, the victory, no, the victory. Two reasons is because, one, because after the conquest of Mecca, the, the, the victory is not going to stop. Yes, you've conquered Mecca, but from there, the victory is just going to keep going. So it's called the victory because it just keeps going. That's one explanation. Another explanation, which is very beautiful, is that you only really have a community if everybody knows what the goal is. What do I mean by this? I mean that if Allah had to spell it out and say that this was Fatihu Mecca, it's as if nobody knows what the intention of the Prophet ﷺ was. But because the Prophet ﷺ conveyed the message, that this is the message of, of one God, this is the message of Ibrahim, Ibrahim built the house of the Kaaba, and our goal is to get the Kaaba, then Allah doesn't have to spell out, this is Fatih Mecca, Allah just has to say, this is the Fatih, this is the victory, and that is sufficient because everybody already knows what the victory is. Everybody understanding this? I'll give a very simple example. If Imam Fatin goes up to any one of you and says, we did it, and that's it, just we did it, and doesn't say what it is, if the person goes, yes, then I know that you guys have a beautiful community. Everybody knows the goals of the community. If the brother's like, we did what? What are you talking about? What are you, we did, well, yeah, I'm happy, but I don't know. It? What's it? That means that as a community, we don't have common goals. Is everybody, get, is everybody getting this point? Is this getting clear? We as a community have to ask ourselves, what is our one year, five year, 10 year plan? What are we working on these days? We should, as a community, know what the project is, so that when, inshallah, he, uh, Imam Fatin does actually stand up and say, we did it, everybody, takbir Allahu Akbar, because everybody knows, everybody's in the same mindset, we have a community, similar mind, uh, similar intentions and so forth, similar uh, goals. That's what really makes a community. So this is, this is an indication of when Allah says, 
the help of Allah came and the Fath. Everybody knows. I know what the Fath is because everybody knew exactly what the objective was in terms of Fath Mecca. When you see that Nasrullah is the means, Allah is taking credit for the entire means. Imagine, the Prophet ﷺ has been working on this for what? Something, what, almost, almost 20 years? Yeah, 23, 23, uh, 23 years is the entirety of his life, but at this point it's like something close to 20 years of Allah Ta'ala Alam. 20 years giving da'wah trying to work on this project. And then after finally the victory of, of bringing so many people to Islam and people accepting and going through battle after battle and struggle and, and donating money and going through poverty and hardship, Allah takes all the credit. Look at the humility. We need to be humble. This is a problem that we have in our community. The moment anybody does something, they want to say, hey everybody, I'm the one that did this. Put my name, put my face on the wall. You know? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, no, it's not like that. Even after all the struggle you went through, this is Nasrullah. This is my vic I'm the one that gave you the help. I'm the one that gave you the victory. You have to humble yourself and you have to be grateful that you were even used as an instrument to execute the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the humility that is being imbued into the believers. Nasrullahi, and then, so the goal is Fath, and the means was Nasrullah. So you have the, the, the goal and the means put together. Nasrullahi wal Fath. Now, I do want to touch upon again for a few more, uh, just a little bit longer about this topic of, usually you think of a political victory or a great victory as a violent victory. Like, what a great defeat, we conquered so many people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the opposite and makes it a peaceful one. I want to mention a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ spells this out so beautifully. I really, I think this is a, a hadith that it requires a lot of thought. The Prophet ﷺ says this is in Sahih Muslim. Ya ayyuhal nas, O people, la tatamanna liqa al adu. Don't wish for meeting of the enemy. Muslims aren't violent people. There are some young people, and this is natural, you know, bravery is a good quality, obviously, everybody knows that being brave is good, and young men often want to display their bravery. And the problem with that is sometimes they end up walking around with their chest out looking for a fight. You know, I want to prove how brave I am. You know, who wants to mess with me type of thing. That is not the attitude of the believer. The Prophet says, oh people, ya ayyuhal nas, la tatamanna liqa al adu. Don't wish for the, uh, uh, don't wish for meeting of the enemy. وَاسْأَلُ اللَّهِ الْعَافِيَةِ Ask Allah for afiyah, for peace. You should want peace in life. You should want that things go smoothly. You don't want to be this person that's looking for a fight. However, this is the, this is the flip side. So there's a balance. On the one hand, you're not a violent person. On the other hand, you're not a pacifist that will, every time you're bullied and picked on, you just curl up in a ball and just lay down in the fetal position. That is not the attitude of the believer. Here's the flip side. of and the, the rest of the hadith continues and says what? فَإِذَا لَقِيتُمُوهُمْ but if you do meet the enemy, if it does so happen that the fight comes to you, not that you go out for the fight, but that the fight comes to you, then what? Then isbiru, then be patient. Then be patient and know for a fact that paradise is underneath the shade of the sword. That's a powerful image. Think about that. We're talking about be so patient if somebody is trying to oppress you. You're not a pacifist, you don't just lay down and take it. That is not the attitude of the believer. The attitude of the believer is, I want peace, I'm a peaceful person. However, if you start violating me, violating my space, and thinking that I'm just some pushover that you can just abuse me, I'm going to be patient, I'm going to be steadfast, I'm going to be persistent, and I'm going to fight back. To the point that even if it comes to the point where I see the sword coming down on my head and the shade of the sword is right on my face, that's where paradise is. That's the attitude of the believer, according to the hadith in Sahih Muslim. So I just want to show this balanced approach. It's not cowardice, it's not recklessness. That is how the believer should be, between these two. That's the expression. The expression says, uh, courage is the midpoint between cowardice and recklessness. I believe that's a very uh, famous quote. It's a beautiful quote. I really enjoy that quote. I really appreciate it because it's very true that if you want to be courageous, you're not reckless, but you're also not a coward. It's somewhere in between those two. وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا That you see, wa and رَأَيْتَ, you see, you saw, a nas, people. This could refer to the people in general. This could refer to the Arabs of Hijaz and Najd and Yemen and Sham and Iraq. Or specifically, there's one hadith, beautiful hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ says, when the people, when 700 people came from Yemen to embrace Islam after Fath Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ja'a Nasrullah, Ja'a al Fath, wa Ja'a Ahlu Yemen. That Allahu Akbar, the people of, uh, that, that, that the help of Allah came, the victory came, and that the people of Yemen came. So imagine, this is how much 
uh, respect and, and, and honor the Prophet is giving to the people of Yemen. Then the Prophet says, قَوْمٌ نَقِيَّةٌ نَقِيَّةٌ قُلُوبُهُمْ لَيِّنَةٌ طَاعَتُهُمْ الْإِيمَانُ يَمَانِي الْإِيمَانُ يَمَانِي وَالْفِقْهُ يَمَانِي وَالْحِكْمَةُ يَمَانِيَة Beautiful hadith. The Prophet says what? That Iman is Yemeni. Faith is Yemeni. That Fiqh is Yemeni and that wisdom is Yemeni. This is a uh, authentic hadith in Sahih ibn Hibban. Now I want to clarify because I gave this talk last night and there was <laughs> almost a fight broke out. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Because I mentioned this hadith and someone got upset. They were like, who do these Yemenis think they are? This is going to create kibbutz in their hearts. They don't... Now look, let me... <laughs> and so then, then there were some Yemeni brothers and they were like, "How you know, this is the words of the Rasulullah. So anyway, it got a little contentious. It was funny. Alhamdulillah, everybody was fine. But I thought it was a little bit funny that, uh, you know, there was a bit of a problem here. Now let's just clarify something. This hadith is not saying that every single Yemeni person is like an angel. No. There are people that do good deeds, there are people that do bad deeds, right? But this is, there are, the Prophet ﷺ has different hadith about different people. The Prophet ﷺ said many beautiful things about the people of Sham. The Prophet ﷺ said many beautiful things about the people of Persia. The Prophet ﷺ has different hadith about different people saying beautiful qualities of them. And we do this in our common life as well. You see that a certain group of people, they have a certain quality, you mention it. Like I've been to Malaysia. And I know others that have been to Malaysia and, and even Indonesia. Sweet people. So you can say, does this mean that not a single one of them has a harsh personality? No, it means generality. So there are many different uh, 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 great believers and great fuqaha and great ulama that have come from Yemen. And so this is the Prophet ﷺ is talking about this and we shouldn't take it to either extreme. Uh, that's a very important point. And so inshallah, last point. Last point, inshallah. I don't want to take up too much time. Last point that I want to mention is that the Prophet has a very scary hadith in uh, Al Haythami. It's a Sahih hadith. The Prophet says, This is very, very scary. The Prophet says, What? That people, indeed, people will enter into the religion in big groups, but they'll also exit in big groups. What is this a, a prediction of? After the death of the Prophet ﷺ, there was the apostasy. Many people, they said, oh, well, if the Prophet's dead, then I don't want to be Muslim anymore, right? So they left Islam. So this is one thing, a miraculous uh, prediction of the Prophet ﷺ. But also, you can see the um, wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ here, that we know what a fad is, right? We know what trends are. Trends get really, really hot, then get really, really cold, right? People get, oh, everybody, everybody loves a certain trend for a little while, and then they drop off the map really quickly, right? And so after Fath Mecca, it almost, you know, some people definitely were entering Islam because of sincerity. There's no doubt about it. But when a lot of people are coming into Islam, you find that other people, they just go because they're going with the flow, right? This is just, this is human nature. When a lot of people are doing something, then it becomes a trend. And then some people, they start doing it too, and they don't even know what they're doing. So because of this fact, the Prophet is predicting and saying, look, a lot of people may come, but a lot of people may go. So you have to be mentally prepared for that. I relate that to today in what way? Alhamdulillah, we have people that embrace Islam. Alhamdulillah. People embrace Islam, come to the masjid, they say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Shalom Rasulullah. Everybody's giving high fives, hugs, takbirs, all that stuff. It's beautiful. The problem is what? When we just say, oh, lots of people are entering Islam, and then we just forget about them. What happens after that? A lot of people enter, and a lot of people feel like, look, I left my friends, I left my family, I left my old life, I came to this new life, and nobody's here for me. So eventually their Iman and their faith and their Islam subit stagnates. It just sort of doesn't really go anywhere. And eventually they forget about everything. And they just, you know, maybe they'll say, yeah, I guess I'm a Muslim, but I don't know really, you know, and it just becomes nothing of it. And I've seen statistics, uh, it was a while, I don't remember the exact survey, but I do remember a while ago I saw some statistics talking about Muslims like to brag about how they have so many people entering Islam, they don't see how many people are leaving of those exact same converts. This is apparently a st uh, statistically provable that there, uh, people have done surveys to see how many people who embrace Islam because they learned about it, they, they got to know the community, they really you know, loved the Muslims, and they got really excited, they embraced Islam, but then there was no follow-up, and so their faith stagnated and then eventually it just became nothing. So when you look at this, the numbers, it's, it's, it's more than, than we, we, we would want. It's very scary how many people leave. I don't have the exact numbers on me, but I do know it's a significant phenomenon that re requires our attention. So all I'm trying to say is that we need to be very, very careful with this issue. Uh, when we see people coming to Islam, we don't just say high fives, takbir, and then walk away. 
we have to take this very seriously. So with that, inshallah, I close. And I do hope, it, hope to open this up to a uh, fruitful discussion, inshallah ta'ala, where we can have comments and questions uh, as we do every week, inshallah ta'ala. So who's going to start us off? I don't know where Imam Fatin ran away to. And, and uh, Brother Hanafi, he's usually here with great comments. So who's going to help us out? I'd I, I like to, um, um, to say like, that makes a lot of sense where when people come here, we have to feed them the, uh, the information of Islam. Absolutely. So that they can have something to eat on. Yeah. If we don't digest it for them and give them a taste of it, they'll never know yeah. what it is. Well, I mean, I think the best, I mean, there's, there, there's two main tracks of da'wah. Da'wah is theory and then practice, right? So the theory of Islam is the Qur'an and the Sunnah, like the, the words, right? The, the information, right? So you give them books and pamphlets and explain to them the history and, and, and the ideology and every, the, the beliefs of Islam, the ideas of Islam. But then after that, and, and that's very convincing. A lot of people, they say, look, Islam made a lot of sense. You know, I, I read the Qur'an, I read a hadith, I read about many a hadith in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and that was, it, that was enough for me. And they embraced Islam. The problem then is, do you have a vibrant community that they can see, oh, this is what it looks like when Islam is practiced. I'm not just reading the book that says pray five times a day. I'm seeing the believers. I'm not just reading a hadith that says, treat your brother, you know, love for your brother what you love for yourself. I'm seeing them act this way. They're loving each other like they love themselves. Like they're, they're giving to the other person even more before they take for themselves. You see? So when you live it, I'll tell you about, you know, something to chew on. Absolutely. That's true da'wah. And that's why the, Allah didn't just reveal a book. Allah didn't send down a book and say, here, people figure it out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a book through a messenger, a living example. That's the complete package. So we need to embody that mentality and truly, we, we need to make sure that our masajid reflect that community. Yes, Bismillah. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Bismillah. Uh, so, uh, um, I, I, I remember when, um, a brother, when a brother was teaching me, he said, um, he said, if you think you're going to be Muslim and not have no trials and tribulations, then for sure that you're in the wrong religion. Uh-huh. 100%. That's, uh, that, 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 you, I, just like I, I absolutely agree that this is something that, um, you know, uh, anything, anything truly good that comes to you in life doesn't come for free, right? The best things in life are, are the things that you work for, the things that you struggle for. And, um, you know, there's no reason to think that if life is a test, that you're going to be able to say, you know, I embrace the truth and then that's it. You just, like that's, that's one of the things that I've always found kind of um, somewhat funny about Christianity is, is that it's just this idea of you've accepted, you've accepted Jesus and then now you're just waiting to go to heaven and you literally have to do nothing. It's just like you're in the waiting room. You're just like, whatever, what, what do we do now? Oh, nothing, you're going to heaven, so just chill out. So, and I, I always, I, in fact, I ask Christians this question. I say, you know, for me, because I go through struggles, some days I'm feeling so grateful to Allah. So other days I'm relying upon Allah. Some days I'm being very patient. And it's a true relationship. And, and if you think about any relationship, let's say a marriage, right? What makes a true marriage bond strong is not just going through good times all the time. If you and your wife just went on vacation after vacation, you guys wouldn't really have a true bond. A true bond is formed when sometimes they're happy, but sometimes there's fights and sometimes there's struggle and sometimes there's riches and sometimes there's poverty. And because you guys have gone through that roller coaster together, you have a true bond. At the end of it, you can say, this is my wife, this is my husband, and you guys have a real, real bond, right? So in that same way, when the believer knows that I'm going to accept Islam and I'm going to go through struggles, that's what makes their faith real. But if you just say, oh, I accepted Jesus and now I'm just waiting to go to heaven and there's no, you know, there's nothing I have to do and there's no, nothing, nothing. I'm just chilling, I'm just waiting. Mm -hmm. And then, so, there, so what real bond do you even connect? How do you even develop a relationship with God? That's my question. And I, I, I haven't heard yet a, a Christian answer me this question in, a, 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 in any way, actually. I've never heard them really explain to me anything about that. So I think that's a, that's a heavy angle that you can come to them uh, with, inshallah ta'ala. Um, was there, there was something else I want to say to that point, but I'm forgetting. Bismillah. Bismillah, he was uh, earlier here, he said, the farewell, I'm just trying to get that bashing of the Ammara and the... Uh, oh, yeah. The yeah, so a, the uh, Bishara means good news. The Bishara of this Surah is the good news of a victory. The Ishara, Ishara means an indication. The Ishara, the indication of the Surah is that now this is the end of your mission, therefore you are going to be returned to your Lord. It doesn't say that explicitly, it's just indicated, it's subtly, uh, you can read it, reading between the lines if you will. And the Amr, 
Amr means a command. The command is, we're going to get it to it next week, inshallah. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا The last ayah. We, we only did two ayah today. Next week, we're going to do the last final ayah, which is a heavy ayah, which is a beautiful ayah. And we're going to go into detail as to what it means and what it implies, inshallah ta'ala. Oh, I, that's what I wanted to say. I did want to mention one more thing. Just as a personal, something personal for me. I learned about Islam and embraced Islam. You guys want to know when? The summer of 2001. Do you know what that means? Okay, I mean, what it, 2001. What happened right after the summer of 2001? 9-11, that's right. So I, I, I personally found that to be very, very funny. That, I mean, it's not that funny. That, that wasn't funny. What was funny was the fact that I said to, I, you know, I learned about this deen and I said, uh, made dua and I said, Ya Allah, I'm going to be serious about this deen. And I knew that... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us that if you're serious, I'm going to test you. So I embraced this thing and then within, you know, a month or whatever, a few months, on the news, Muslims are the new bad guys, you know, and Muslims are under the microscope. And, and I'm like, huh, I, this is the promise, you know, it was like, are you serious? You seriously want to embrace this? You seriously want to, you know, uh, prove that you believe in this? and that you're willing to be tested by it, you're not just gonna get by, like let's say if you embrace Buddhism and like nobody knows about it, nobody cares, nobody asks any questions, you're just kinda, you know, go, you know, slipping through the cracks of society and nobody even pays attention. No, no, you're a Muslim and now the spotlight's gonna be on you. Can you handle it? Are you still gonna walk the walk? So I, that's how I felt about my own personal history with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, embracing of Islam. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-Islam. Yeah, tawadhan. Mom was in 71, but so, it, was worse, it was worse than that because it was 2011. Yeah, yeah, it was, It's always been something. Yeah, yeah, like it's always something. something. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, uh, at that time, yeah, there's, I mean, there's always something, right? There's always, I, I, this is my own personal view, that's all I'm saying. Sure, what is it, Menachem Begin or Saddam Hussein, and then the, the Shah of Iran did That's the, right, the, uh, Ho hostage crisis. Right. It was in 79, right? It was always, always some against Muslims. Yeah, yeah. I know, of course. It didn't start at 9-11, though. Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying that to me, as a young person, and then this big thing happens, it was, it was interesting. It was, it was a turning point. Oh, well, I'm saying when I came into the thing, like I can understand you saying it there, but I'm saying like I caught hell before that. Oh, uh, for sure. I'm, oh, I'm not denying anybody's struggle. I'm not, I'm not trying to put it like that. I'm just saying that to me, from my individual perspective, it was quite interesting the way the, the events played out. It, it seemed quite um, telling. It seemed quite like. A, uh, the fulfillment of exactly what Allah promises. That like, you say you're a believer, I'm going to put you through something. Go ahead, Bismillah, uh, Bismillah brother Khalid. Yeah, um, inshallah, about just a, uh, like a comment, I would say, uh, about Abu Bakr, the Lord, oh. when, this, uh, when this surah was revealed, I think maybe you can elaborate on it. He started like uh, crying. Yes. Because yeah. of that second point, as you um, mentioned about Ishara. Yeah. And he understood it as uh, compared to the other companions. They were like, like wondering, like, why is he crying? You That's know, right. To just show his level of deep understanding of Quran and you know of, yep. of the revelation. That's know, right. So. Yeah, uh, as the brothers mentioning that Abu Bakr, he had a special, uh, he had a deeper understanding than most others. That when. The Prophet ﷺ was completing his mission. He was the one who was weeping. He was the one who was sad. And everybody's like, "What's what's what are you sad about? This is a this is a victory. We should be celebrating." But he knew what that implied. That once the dean, once like I like the analogy of like a, you know the the snowball effect. Once the ball starts rolling. So once the initial roll starts going, and now the momentum has been built, the Prophet ﷺ has done his job. If he's done his job, he's not just going to linger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take him back because your, your job is done. So, the, uh, so Abu Bakr had that foresight and knew that that was inevitably going to happen. And so that's why it, uh, on the one hand, obviously he's happy about the victory. On the other hand, he's wondering what are we going to do without the Prophet helping us. SubhanAllah, he was two years younger than the Prophet and he died two years after the Prophet died. They both died at the age of 63. 63. Both, yeah, both at the age of 63, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I'll be 63 tomorrow. Mashallah. Really? Mashallah. Allah. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> okay, well, let's. Moving on. Oh, yeah, Bismillah. You were going to say. Um, you remember when they was talking about uh, Abu Bakr and when he caught the, uh, the Shia team? When Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr. Yeah, caught? The, the Shia team when he, when, he, when he caught him by the throat. No, that's uh, the Prophet himself did that. Right. The Prophet was standing in Salah and he grabbed him. Yes. That wasn't Abu Bakr. Yeah, Abu Bakr was the one who 
Maybe he's uh, referring to an instance of, of Abu Huraira when Shaitan came. That's that's not catching. That's that's uh, he was he was he was uh, that's a whole different hadith about the, yeah somebody coming to uh, Abu Huraira and, and uh, giving him uh, you have, there was a dialogue. If, I think three nights in a row, a different dialogue, and then the Prophet said that you're dealing with Shaitan. Now I don't I don't have that narration in front of me, so I don't want to expound on it too much and you know get it half right. Um, but it's okay, we'll move on, inshallah. We'll do our uh, comments, comments. Khair. I have a question. Bismillah, tafadda. I have nothing to do with, uh, with today. It's about uh, al-wit. 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 Okay, yeah. Salat al-wit. Yeah. He said one rakah after the Isha. It can be one, it can be three, it can be five. There's different ahadith. Correct. Yep. Yep. If you, yeah, if you want to, like, like like some people, and this is a beautiful thing, they want to make sure that they do catch their Salat al-Witr, and so they want to do it like the, easy, like without making a big burden, right? Because yes, it's beautiful to say, oh, I want to pray like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and pray this many, so many, so many raka'ah for hours, but realistically, you, maybe you'll do that once, and then after that you'll just pass out and never do it again, right? So it's much better to do something small and consistent. Rather than the hadith, أَحَبُّ uh, الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى Adwamuha wa inqal, right? That's the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that the best of uh, the most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those that are done consistently, even if they're small. So if you want to do it something consistent and small, right after Salat al Isha, yes, you can pray one raka'ah of Salat al Witr, and that is inshallah valid. Is it between Salat al Isha to before Salat al Fajr? Before the Adhan of Fajr comes in, that's the time of uh, Witr. After Isha, all the way till the Adhan of Fajr. If you pray it before you sleep, it's called Qiyamul Layl. If you go to bed and wake up before the Adhan of Fajr, that's called Tahajjud. They're both Salah, but they just have different names. In the end of the day, they're still, you know, praying to Allah. I mean, it's, it's, the, same, it's, the, same, it's the same formula of the Raka'ah, it's the same performance of a Raka'ah. But uh, I just want to let you know that they have different uh, value and different names and, you know, different... Um, Flavor, if you will, you know, when you go to bed and wake up middle of the night, everybody's asleep. You can fight off that sleep, make wudu. There's something special about that. It gives a special name called Tahajjud. One of the most beautiful names. I met a brother, Saudi brother. His name was uh, Hajjad. Hajjad. And I was like, Hajjad, I never heard that name before. And then I, I found out that Hajjad means the person who regularly prays Tahajjud. And I was like, wow, that's a nice name. I never heard that. Hajjad, yeah. It's a nice name, right? I thought it was a beautiful name. I was like, well, you know, what a beautiful thing to live up to, to regularly pray to Hajjud. I thought that's beautiful. One time I only, that's the only time I met someone. Yes, Walek Sam. Tahajjud could be what? Two, four, six, eight. So, Tahajjud, you can pray. The typical, the, the sort of standard way to do it is to do two at a time and then finish with the odd. Now, whether you pray that odd with three or one, that's up to you. But, but basically, you can do two and then two and then two and then two and then go as, as much as you want. Until you finish with the odd. And a lot of people will just do the one, just to make it simple. And other people will say, no, no, we'll do the three. There's different narrations. The Prophet did it, did it in different ways. Different scholars, uh, you know, this madhab might do it this way, this madhab might do it that way. At the end of the day, I'm not trying to push anybody towards one particular uh, perspective. I, from what I understand, there's a little bit of room in these matters. So my suggestion is, you wake up in the night... You pray, how much strength do you have? You, have? you have strength to pray two, four, six, eight. You do as much as you can, and then you finish off with either one or three to finish up the witr, and then you're good. Make sense? Khair, inshallah. As long as it's odd or even. It's good to end with the odd. It's not a fard, it's not an obligation, but it is highly recommended to pray salat al-witr. It's it, it, like after all of, the, uh, far, uh, all of the obligatory prayers, the five daily prayers, if you're asking yourself, okay, I've been praying the five daily prayers for many years of my life, I've been consistent. What is the next most important thing? Like, what is the next thing that I can do that is at the top of the list? The next thing would be witr. That after Salat al-Isha, I at least pray one rakah, if not three, if not, you know, like, uh, you know, as we said, two, 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 as much as you want. You can open it back up. Uh, uh, you can do witr and then open it back up later. This, is, this, becomes a, this becomes a fiqh issue that I don't really want to get into because yeah. there's different views on it and it starts to get technical. And what, okay, let's put it this way. Just for simplicity's sake, try to finish with the odd. Try to finish. Witr means odd. Okay, that's what, it, that's what the linguistically it means. Try to finish with the odd. 
Then some people will say, well, what if I did my witr and then I want to do more two rak'ahs, now what do I do? Do I now close again with another witr or does that one witr count? I don't want to get into all that because things start to get a little bit confusing. Just try your best to finish your night with witr. Is that easy? It can be go, before you go to bed, or it can be you go to bed, wake up, and before Fajr comes in. It can be both. Like I said, if it's before you go to bed, it's called Qiyamul Layl. That's the, that's the, qiyam means standing, Layl means night. Qiyamul Layl means standing in the night. If you go to bed, wake back up, that's called Tahajjud. There's only, yeah, which is mentioned once in the Quran. The word Tahajjud is mentioned once, once in the Quran. Yes? You're trying to ask about? We, I just talked about with her. What else do you want to know? No, I mean like, uh, I mean like, they say like, uh, there are some surah, like, when I pray, I'm like, uh, what you like, I mean like, there are some surah, like, it's possible. There are certain uh, ahadith, which the Prophet ﷺ did recite that uh, have been recorded, but that does not make them an obligation. You don't have to think to yourself, oh, if I'm praying, like for example, uh, like for example, in the two raka'ah before Fajr, there are a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ would pray and recite surahs uh, Kafirun and surah Ikhlas. Does that mean that you must do that? No. It just means that this, was, this is what, what the Prophet ﷺ did, right? He did that. So it's nice to follow that, but it's also up to you to pray with whichever surahs. It's not an obligation. So it, are there a hadith that mention which some surahs that the Prophet ﷺ would pray when you pray at night, yes, there are some, uh, some narrations. And if you want to follow them, then absolutely, be, you know, it's beautiful. But don't think that you must. So personally, I think it's very helpful if, let's say you're memorizing Qur'an, right? And you're on a certain surah that you're working on. You're on a certain surah that you're memorizing or a certain surah that you're reviewing. Why not just pray that night with that surah, right? That makes sense. So that as you go through the Qur'an and memorize surah after surah, you use those surahs at night. Because if you restrict yourself to say, oh no, I must only pray with this surah for witr because the Prophet ﷺ did that on one occasion, then you're limiting yourself and you're not enjoying the full Qur'an. It's much more beautiful to have a... Um, I mean, following the sunnah is amazing. I'm not trying to disparage that. But part of the sunnah is to enjoy the entirety of the Qur'an. To go through surah after surah, night after night, and just stand with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reciting to Allah, learning, and connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's part of the beauty. So it would be a little bit unfortunate if you missed out on that and only restricted yourself to one thing. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Yes? I, I remember uh, there was a, um, a hadith that was said about, um, about um, the, uh, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله. So part three إن شاء الله of this surah. I know it's only three ayat long and we've taken three weeks to get through it. So الحمد لله. Hopefully there's some uh, some good in that. إن شاء الله تعالى. Hopefully there's good detail in there. So now we are on the final ayah. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا Beautiful ayah, beautiful ayah, and it really does deserve all the attention we're going to give it. As inshallah you'll see, it's a, it's a very heavily laden uh, ayah. The fa here is uh, called jawabu sharq. The sharq means a condition, and whenever you give a condition, usually there's an answer to that condition. Like, if you do this, then something, right? That's usually how it's done. So when you see people, you know, the Nasrullah wal Fath, and, and you see the people entering into the deen, then, then what? The jawab, the answer. Fa sabbih bihamdi rabbika. Make tasbih of Allah. And bihamdihi, uh, of his praises, of his hamd, right? We know alhamdulillah, all praises due to Allah. So tasbih is like glorification or declaring how uh, perfect Allah is with, that, with no imperfections. Now here, let me get into a little bit more detail. This word, tasbih, is very... Well, actually, first, before I say that, what's beautiful is that in the first half, we have the external victory, right? So the external victory was Fatih al-Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ entering into Mecca, destroying the idols, that's the physical victory. But the physical victory is only representative of the internal victory, which is having your heart connected to Allah. So after destroying the idols, the physical shirk, you have to get rid of your internal shirk or your internal uh, you know, uh, evils. And how do you do that? Tasbih. 
فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ And hamd, making praise of Allah, saying Alhamdulillah, بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ making, making istighfar, asking Allah to forgive you. Making tawbah, asking Allah because he is at tawab asking Allah to, for, uh, to uh, accept your repentance. These are all the ways that you get rid of the internal shirk that is in your heart, getting rid of it just, just after mentioning Allah's external victory of destroying the physical shirk of the idols. Because let's be honest, the idol itself doesn't do anything. It's what's in your heart, it's your relationship to that idol that makes you pray to it. And in our cases, perhaps we don't have physical idols, but you know how we can have idols in our heart. Because for instance, if a person is obsessed with fame or obsessed with money, these are things that they put all their energy towards. These are things that all their thoughts are towards. This is all they ever care about. And so it's as if they've turned money into their own personal deity, their own personal God. Why? Because this is the thing that they give all their attention to and all their care to. So it's not enough to just destroy the physical idol. You have to also get rid of the uh, uh, idol within, and that is the the, the 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 internal victory of tasbih, of hamd, of istighfar, and of tawbah. Of uh, so, and now to go into uh, more detail, let's look at these individually. So, when you say Subhanallah, what are you actually saying? Glory be to Allah. But that's 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 the translation you'll typically find. Let's go into it a little bit more in depth. The verb sabaha. Who can tell me what sabaha means in Arabic? Ante Sheikh. No, 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 that's sabaha. I'm just saying sabaha. Sibaha. What is sibaha? Somebody knows what sibaha is. Sabaha is swimming. Sabaha is to swim. Sibaha is swimming. So, what do you do when you're swimming? You are making sure that you tread water. You keep yourself afloat so that you don't sink and drown, right? So, it, so in swimming, there is the idea of keeping something up, as in yourself. You're swimming, you're keeping yourself up in the water so that you don't drown uh, and sink. Sabaha, coming from the same root letters, uh, seen, ba, and ha, it means to keep Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your own estimation, elevated high, in your own mind, making sure that you never let the, the uh, uh, concept, the idea of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala become lower. What does that mean? For instance, let's say you get into a car accident. You start saying to yourself, why did this happen to me? This is wrong. Why did God allow this to happen? God is unjust. He shouldn't have ha let this happen to me. I don't deserve this. So what you're really saying is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr is wrong. Allah's decree is incorrect. Allah's choice to give, uh, Allah's, uh, um, uh, you know, in Allah's wisdom, this was incorrect, this was wrong. So this is in and of itself is questioning Allah's wisdom, questioning Allah's greatness and justice and, and mercy and so forth. And so you are allowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your own estimation to be lowered. So making tasbih of Allah is saying, like for example, Allah in the Quran says, uh, 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 Glory be to Allah, He is much higher than whatever they attribute to Him, whatever they do shirk with Him, uh, like whatever idols they attribute to Him. So tasbih is usually done when in the face of shirk, when in the face of some sort of negative attitude towards Allah, you try to remove those negative thoughts from your brain by saying what? Subhanallah. I'm, that's what subhanAllah is. And another simple way to put it is the deletion of every negative thought towards Allah. You are cleaning out all the clutter, all the nonsense, all the evil uh, uh, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah is the opposite. You are affirming all positive attributes to Allah. Everything that you see that is beautiful, everything that you see that is sweet and kind and nice and everything positive, you're saying Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah, all of it returns back to Allah. So you can see how these two things go hand in hand. Subhanallah, deletion of all the negative. Alhamdulillah, affir affirmation of all the positive. Is everybody catching this? Is everybody seeing how these two things go beautifully together? What's interesting is that the believer is always between two attitudes. Sabr and shukr, right? This is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that عَجَبَ uh, amr الْمُؤْمِنِ That uh, strange is the affair of the believer. He's always between sabr and shukr. Bad things happen, he has sabr. Good things happen, he has shukr. He's grateful, right? This can be related to subhanAllah and alhamdulillah. Why? Something bad happens, you have sabr and you always say, no, 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 I'm not going to be, I'm not going to say anything negative or think anything negative about Allah. I'm going to say subhanAllah in, even in the hardest times. That Allah is high above any negative thoughts I might have. And in good times, you make shukr. And what do you say when, when good things happen? You say, Alhamdulillah. You see, so subhanAllah and Alhamdulillah go hand in hand with the idea of sabr and shukr. Is everybody seeing the parallel here? So subhanAllah and Alhamdulillah, they have a very beautiful relationship with one another. Because they balance each other out. And it's interesting when we say subhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, what we're really doing is, it's like you're reformatting your own mind. 
what you're doing is you're saying, Oh Allah, I'm taking out every negative thought. SubhanAllah. Every negative thought I might have, I'm removing it. Alhamdulillah, I'm affirming every positive thought. Now, who is this for? This is for nobody but Allah. La ilaha illallah. This only can be attributed to Allah. And now that I've said, SubhanAllah, deleted the negative. Alhamdulillah, affirmed the positive. La ilaha illallah, deliver, uh, 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 attributed this only to Allah. I have a certain idea of who Allah is. Now what do you say? Allahu Akbar. Whatever my idea is, it's still not good enough. You guys seeing how the four put, put together? They have a logical progression. And it's like a way of putting yourself in the right, right mindset. Whatever you're going through in life, what do you do? SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. When you say this and you understand it, it is really having a transformative effect on your mind, on your heart, on your whole attitude, on your whole perspective of life. Is everybody seeing, uh, we're seeing what I'm saying? Alhamdulillah, good. Next. So we should remember that the internal victory is more important than the external victory. That's why Allah says in Surah An-Kabut, وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ The dhikr of Allah, that's the greatest thing. Why? Because when it comes to all the external things, those things don't matter as much as the state of your heart. That on, uh, we know that um, on the Day of Judgment, the only thing that will be judged is the state of your heart. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهِ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ that's, that's all that matters. On Judgment Day, it doesn't matter if you have mal wa banoon. It doesn't matter if you have wealth or children. The only one who's in a safe position is the one who comes with a qalbin salim, with a sound heart. خير إن شاء الله. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ What can this mean? It can be looked at from a few different ways. Make tasbih of Allah along with hamd. Another interpretation, do tasbih of Allah by doing hamd. As in, uh, 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 show gratitude to Allah by always thinking positive thoughts and never thinking any negative thoughts. Under the third interpretation, make tasbih while being grateful. So while doing it. And the fourth interpretation, perfect the way. As in do tasbih, as in remove any negative things from the way you do hamd of Allah. So for instance, you, pra you praise Allah by making dhikr. You praise Allah by praying salah. Make sure that you remove anything negative from that. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ These two come together. So these are different interpretations and different understandings of them. Next. وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ this is interesting. Istighfar, this ghafara means to forgive. Istighfara means to seek forgiveness. Istighfirhu means seek his forgiveness. Who is him in this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the, the, the command here is saying, now that you've seen that your victory has come, now that you see the people entering into the deen, make tasbih of Allah, make the hamd of Allah, also seek his forgiveness. Now, this brings up a few uh, questions. The first interpretation is, Seek his forgiveness for who? For the people. An nas, because Allah just mentioned, uh, 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 You're going to see these people coming in. So, what do you do? Istaghfirhu, seek his forgiveness on behalf of them. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is no, you yourself, you seek the forgiveness of Allah. This brings up a controversial question Does the Prophet have a bunch of sins? Does he, does he do a bunch of evil things that he has to ask, ask Allah for forgiveness? It's an important question that we have to ha have addressed. Because there might be some orientalist who is very clever and says, you follow the sunnah of your prophet? You, yes. Really? Didn't he make mistakes? No. His sunnah is a good sunnah. I should follow his sunnah. No. Here in the Quran, it says that he should seek the forgiveness of Allah. If he has to seek Allah's forgiveness, that means he has mistakes. If he has mistakes, you shouldn't follow his sunnah. Boom. Now what do you say? Now the Muslim, now the Muslim says, uh, mm, uh, e, uh. That's, see? We have to, we have to be... We have to be prepared, prepared for these type of questions. So, this, this d d uh, brings up a very important... Also in, uh, in Ramadan, we say, Yes, absolutely. Can we, uh, can we leave questions and answers for the end, inshallah ta'ala? So, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to get through everything. Remember the questions or, or comments at the end, inshallah. No problem. Barakallahu feek. Jazamatala khairan. Next. So, the first thing that we can mention in response to this doubt of, was the Prophet ﷺ a sinful person? The first answer we have is, sin or no sin, Allah loves istighfar. Because it's a sign of your humility. That's one thing that we should remember. Number two, is that we cannot compare our sins to the extremely minor infractions that the Prophet ﷺ may have done. For instance, the Prophet ﷺ, as Allah mentions in Surah 80, verse number 1, Surah 80 is Surah Abasa. What does Allah say? Abasa wa tawalla an jahul a'ma. Allah says that he frowned and he turned away. So what is this referring to? The Prophet ﷺ is giving da'wah to a very prominent member of Quraysh and he wants to bring him to Islam because if he embraces Islam, then inshallah that will have a positive effect on lots of people. And then Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum anhu, who is a believer, comes to the Prophet ﷺ and has questions. Now he is blind, but he's not deaf. So he can hear that the Prophet ﷺ is in a conversation. And yet he still keeps asking questions. Ya Rasulullah, what about this? What about He has questions. 
What does the Prophet ﷺ do? All he does is, and there's different words, words for frown in Arabic, Abasa is like the least type of a frown. It's just a tiny little bulge on your forehead, just a little bit of a frown, and then turns. The man is blind, he can't even see what the Prophet ﷺ did. Nobody saw it. How can you even call this a sin? But Allah saw it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him out and said, I hold you to an even higher caliber. Do you understand that when we talk about the quote-unquote sin or minor infractions of the Prophet ﷺ, they're at such a high caliber that for us to even call them sins is, to be quite honest, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous. They're not even on that level. They, because the Prophet ﷺ is held to such a high esteem, his quote-unquote infractions are not even something for us to criticize. Allah is so perfect that yes, Allah can criticize His Messenger, but we are so beneath Him that for us to point upwards and say that's a mistake, we're not in a position to do so. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so high that He can uh, call the Prophet out and say, no, even though the man was blind, even though he could not see the frowning, even though he couldn't see the turning, I saw it. And I want you to be even more merciful than that. And I want you to be even more uh, accommodating to the believers than that. I hold you to an even higher status. And the, another thing that we should remember is that there's different layers of istighfar. One layer is when you've done something that angers Allah and you ask Him to forgive you. That's what we do. We do things that are straight up wrong and we ask Allah to forgive us. There's another layer of istighfar. Asking Allah's forgiveness because what? Because you've done something good but you could have done better. Right? If I give $10 in charity and then I say, you know what, I really, I had $100 in my wallet. I could have given. They needed it. I could have given $100. Why didn't I do that? Astaghfirullah, Allah forgive me. Now, did I do something wrong? No, I actually did something good. I gave $10. But I know I could have done better. So I say, Ya Allah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Oh Allah, forgive me. I could have done better. But you, I've still done a good deed. There's an even higher level of istighfar. So that's layer one is when you've done, done something wrong. Layer two is when you've done something good, but you could have done better. Layer three is when you've done the best you could possibly do. You've maxed out 100%. You're 100%. But you know Allah is so great that He deserves even better than your 100%. So you do 100%, you've given everything you've got, but you say, Ya Allah, what you deserve is better than my 100%. I'm just a human being, I'm just weak. I'm, my, my worship should be even better than my 100%. Oh Allah, forgive me. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. So when we look at the istighfar of the Prophet we don't think of it in terms of number one, where he does evils. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, 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 tells him, do istighfar. No, we look at it at number two and number three. Maybe he did good, but he could have done slightly better. Or maybe he's done 100% good, but he's still asking, Oh Allah, forgive me because you deserve even better. Do we all understand this? So now can we answer the uh, Orientalist, the, uh, the clever little person who comes up and says, How do you follow the sunnah? He said he has to do istighfar. That means he does sins. That means his sunnah is no good. Now we have an answer, inshallah ta'ala. Good, good. Alhamdulillah. Moving right along. فَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا This is a very heavily emphasized sentence. Because Allah could have said, فَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ taib Seek his forgiveness, the one who accepts repentance. taib that's what it means. But Allah says, إِنَّهُ Inna means, it's like an emphasizer. Indeed, truly, verily. إِنَّهُ كَانَ كَانَ means was, but in this context, it doesn't mean Allah was the one who accepts repentance, because obviously Allah still accepts repentance. What it means is, He has always been and always will be the one who tawab, not taib. Ta'ib, it means, is ism fa'al. This is ism fa'al. This is ism mubalagha. It's emphasized. So there's four different emphasizers. Innahu, kana is emphasis. Tawaban is in the form of fa'al, which is very heavily emphasized. And also the fact that it's not at tawab, it's tawaban. It's, it, it, it's tanween. I know this is too much detail, inshallah, but just so you know, just remember this. Four different layers of emphasis. What can this be translated as? That seek Allah's forgiveness. Why? Because he is the one who so, 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 so loves and appreciates the one who turns to him in repentance. Four different times I say so. But obviously if it said so, 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 it would be very un uneloquent, right? Instead, the Qur'an is put in such eloquent terms, subhanAllah. إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا It is very heavily emphasized. And what is also, so we already talked about the balance between, uh, between uh, sabr and shukr. Here is another balance, hope and fear. The believer's heart should always be between hope and fear, right? You should have hope in Allah's mercy, you should fear your own mistakes and your own sins. This is the state of the believer. Istaghfirhu, seek his forgiveness, this is fear. Oh, I have to seek his forgiveness, I might have done something wrong. So you should have that healthy fear, uh, uh, questioning yourself, did I do bad, could I have done better, etc. 
إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا He has always been the one who lovingly accepts when you make tawbah to him, when you turn to him in repentance. This is hope. You guys see the balance here between hope and fear? How in this sentence, سَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ Balance between sabr and shukr. إِسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا The balance between hope and fear. You guys seeing this? Alhamdulillah. So it is really, really uh, powerful the way this is all put together. This ayah is just perfectly balanced in the way that it... And these are all matters of the heart. Sabr, shukr, hope, fear. These balancing factors are all, all factors of the heart. Like I said, after the external victory, Allah is really heavily emphasizing the internal victory of the believers. Khair inshallah. Next. Allah says in the Quran, سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ That whatever is in the heavens and the earth exalts and glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if ever you want to be uh, really... You know, people say, I want to be one with nature. You really want to be one with nature? Go out on a mountain, inshallah, on a beautiful uh, day. Go out in the desert, be amongst the, the, the mountains and the rocks and the so on and so forth. And just know for a fact that everything in the heavens and the earth does tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you yourself sit there and make tasbih and be one with nature, inshallah ta'ala. You hear this very common expression, be one with nature. But what does that really mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means that Allah says everything in the heavens and the earth does tasbih. You do tasbih as well of Allah. Now you're being one with nature, inshallah ta'ala. So we actually give a little bit of substance to this idea, to this uh, popular phrase. Also, the combination between subhanallah and alhamdulillah comes in multiple hadith. A famous hadith, everybody knows this a hadith mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Kalimatan khafifatan ala lisan, thaqilatan ala mizan, habibatan ila rahman. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al azim. So subhanallah wa bihamdihi. So you have tasbih and hamd of Allah put together. That two kalimatan, uh, two words. Khafifatan ala lisan, light upon the tongue. Thaqilatan ala mizan, heavy upon the scales. Habibatan ila rahman, they're beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are they? Subhanallah wa, biha, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim. They do it combining tasbih and hamd of Allah. Yeah, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim. These are, these are uh, very heavy, heavy words that we should keep in mind. Yes, khair inshallah. Next. We should remember that the, when Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son Ismail, uh, yeah, Ismail alayhi salam, when, ya, 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 Allah, when they built the Kaaba, what was their dua? We mentioned it previously. What was the dua that they made? Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiyu alim. So in the building of the Kaaba, you have nothing but humility. No arrogance, no pride, simply, oh Allah, I know we've done something great like building the Kaaba. Oh Allah, accept it from us. Pure humility. When the Prophet ﷺ returns that exact same Kaaba from what it had been corrupted into, it, it was surrounded by 360 idols, after cleaning up all that shirk and returning it to, to Tawheed, again you have humility. فَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا Not arrogance, not pr pride, look at what I've done, look at what I've accomplished after 23 years, or let's say uh, more like 22 years, or 21, I can't remember the exact numbers. But anyway, after 20-something years of the Prophet ﷺ struggling to bring back this house to Tawheed, what happens? Pure humility. Remember that this is the Nasrullah. This is Allah's victory and you have to ask Allah to forgive you. So SubhanAllah. Also, uh, when, with regards to, another thing that we need to remember, I emphasize this point a lot, goals. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't sent to spread good. Spread goodness. Why? This is a very vague goal. The Prophet ﷺ was obviously, yes, meant to spread wahi, spread Qur'an, bring people to Islam. But on top of that, the practical goal, before you leave this earth, you are going to change the house of shirk to the house of tawheed. You have to get rid of all these idols that represent shirk and bring it, to, bring it back to what it originally was, the house of tawheed. What does this mean? We should take this example and have practical goals. It's very frustrating. When you go around in the Muslim community, brother and sister, what do you want to do? I want to be good. Okay, but like what, yeah, I have, I have my goal is to be good and nice. <laughs> Habibi, <laughs> you have to be, you know what the difference is between, as my brother, mashallah, brother Khalid mentioned to me just a little while ago, the difference between a dream and a goal is deadlines. That was your quote you told me just a few weeks ago. Deadlines. Tell yourself, what do you really practically want to do? And when are, do you plan on doing it? That's how the believer should be. That is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he doesn't just say, I want to do good. No, no, let's get specific. I want, oh, one day I want to memorize the Qur'an. Really? How much are you going to memorize this week? This month? This year? How much have you memorized this year? It's already, what, September? How many months? How much have you read? How, much have you, how many times do you come to the masjid? How much have you given in charity? Give me some practical numbers. Even if you literally want to give $1 a year, at least it's a goal. But if you just say, oh, I want to be good. 
Nothing. You get, end up, subhanAllah, this is what shaitan does. Keeps telling you, no, you're great, you're great. You know why? Because you want to do good. And, and, and then shaitan keeps on telling you, yeah, 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 no, no, good, good, good. One day good. And then because you never make anything practical, your whole life goes by, you end up going to the grave, you've done nothing good. Just because it was never specific. So we need to recognize this trick of shaitan. Next, beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw that his wife Juwayriya radiallahu anha, she had been making tasbihat after Salat al-Fajr, all the way till past Duha. So imagine, she's making adhkar, making, making adhkar, remembering Allah, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for perhaps well over an hour, maybe two hours, whatever it may be. The Prophet ﷺ comes up to her and says, you know, if you had said four words, just three times, you would have gotten the equivalent of all this adhkar that you have done. What are those words? Subhanallah wa bihamdihi adada, who knows this? Adada khalqihi, wa rida nafsihi, wa zinata arshihi, وَمِدَادَ كَلِمَاتِهِ There you go, the, 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 the wheels are warming up, mashallah, tabarakallah. It takes a second, you know, the wheels have to warm up a little. Look at this dua. First of all, it combines tasbih and hamd. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. So it's bringing these two together. I want to show you the importance of when these two things come together, removing of the negative and affirming of the positive. Subhanallah, how heavy they are. We mentioned kalimatan, that hadith. Now there's the next one. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Adada khalqihi. The number of his khalq. Uh, 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 Every single one of his creation, imagine how many neutrons and uh, protons and uh, electrons, subhanAllah, every single one, if you can number the number of his creation, you're saying, subhanAllah wa bihamdi, the number of times, adada khalqi, wa ridha nafsi, and the, uh, how pleased Allah is with himself, wa ridha nafsi, wa zinata arshi, and the weight of his arsh, of his throne, wa, uh, uh, wa, wa zinata arshi, wa midada kalimati, and the amount of ink it would take to write and all of his praises and all the words that would be glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how, this is, when you say this dua, you get the ajr of, inshallah ta'ala, you get the ajr of saying subhanallah and alhamdulillah that number of times, which is uncountable, right? So this is why it's such a heavy dua. We should always remember this. When we wake up in the morning, what is after Salat al-Fajr? Subhanallah wa bihamdi adada khalqi wa ridha nafsi wa zinata arshi wa madada kalimati. You say that three times inshallah ta'ala. Those four, sorry? Adada khalqi wa ridha nafsihi وَزِنَةَ عَرْشِهِ وَمِدَادَ كَلِمَاتِهِ Yes, this is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. And by the way, in terms of مِدَادَ كَلِمَاتِهِ The ink of his words, this is mentioned in both in Surah uh, Kahf, at the last, uh, second to last surah, uh, ayah in Surah Kahf, and also in Surah Luqman. Allah mentions twice that if all the oceans were, were turned into ink just so to write the praise of Allah, it would never be enough. You'd have to have, oh, add ocean after ocean after ocean. It would never end the greatness of Allah and the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why this hadith, uh, it all ties together. Two last points, inshallah ta'ala, to close with. I have, I have a bunch of other things, but you know, I can't go too long, inshallah. We keep it tight. Two points I want to mention that I find are very beautiful. The Prophet ﷺ just finished his mission, a big part of his mission, of bringing the Kaaba back to Islam, Tawheed. And now he is being given this, as we said last uh, week, the, an ishara, an indication that your, your time is done. Why? Because he's being told now make istighfar. Again, not because he is a sinful person, not because he's done all sorts of wrong things, but because it is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell you to do istighfar after you've completed. Why? Because usually that's a time when you feel pride. That's a time when shaitan comes to you with arrogance. And so Allah says, no, no, no. Don't focus on how great you are. Focus on the fact that you could have done better. Focus on your mistakes. This is true of the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ is ending his life. And Allah is telling him, فَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا Seek the forgiveness of Allah. When we finish our salah, when we finish and we say, Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, what are you supposed to say right after that? Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. You guys are seeing the consistency? I'll give you one more. More consistency. How many times is Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا mentioned in the Qur'an? Who knows the number? Many times, right? Anybody know the exact number? 89 times. 89 times Allah says, Oh, you who have believed, pay attention. I'm going to tell you something important. If you're a believer, pay attention. 89 times throughout the Quran, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. What is the last one? Which is, there's going to have to be a last, right? Which is the last Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu? I'll give you a hint. It's in Surah Tahreem, Surah 66. Anybody who's memorized Surah 66? Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Tubu. Ah, there you go. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. This is the last one. So after all the different times Allah called to the believers and said, Oh, you who have believed, Allah fi finishes by saying, Oh, you who have believed, make tawbah. See the consistency? You finish with what? Istighfar and tawbah. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, tubu ila Allahi. Make tawbah to Allah, tawbatan nasuha. 
a tawbah that is nasuh. We know the hadith, ad-deen nasiha, right? That this deen is nasiha. Nasiha means pure sincerity. Nothing but sincerity. Right? So Allah is saying, tawbah nasuha. Make a tawbah that is so sincere. By the way, this word nasuh only comes once in the Qur'an. In fact, the root letters, nasaha, only show up once in the Qur'an. So it's a very unique ayah. Ya ayu ladina amnu, tubu ila Allahi, tawbatan nasuha. Allah makes this ayah unique and says, this is the final time I'm calling upon you and saying, if you're going to finish, finish with tawbah. Finish by turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with repentance. SubhanAllah, powerful ayah. So these are three different examples of closing with istighfar. We should remember that this is a sunnah when it comes to salah, when it comes to the death, when, on your deathbed, when it comes to uh, uh, this ya ayu ladina amnu. Inshallah, and I also wanted to mention one more point, Inshallah, ta'ala, just one more point. Very, very powerful. Actually, yeah, okay, one more point, Inshallah, ta'ala. that we are now, in, 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 in the context of the surah, the Prophet ﷺ just, we just finished the ayah, uh, nasa fi deenillahi afwaja. You just, you know, you're seeing all these people enter into the deen of Allah. I mean, before he was going to tribe to tribe, trying to, trying to convince them, now he's watching the full tribes come to him and embrace Islam. This is a complete and incredible victory. The problem, however, is what? All these new people came into Islam. The Prophet ﷺ spent with some of these sahaba, he spent 20 years, spent so much time with these sahaba teaching them the deen. Now he's about to leave this world. And now he's seeing all these new people come in. And we know the, the level of ihsan of the Prophet ﷺ is such that he probably wants to say, I want to spend time with them. I want to make sure they understand the deen. I want to give them da'wah. I want them to learn from this, from this character, from this Qur'an. And I want to teach them. But I'm going to leave. And so this is very scary. And so what is the solution for each and every one, single one of us as believers? What is the solution? Make sure you focus on yourself to be a good example. How can you be a good example yourself? It starts with the heart. Tasbih, hamd, Istighfar, Tawbah. So we need to remember this, that we, especially in this masjid, not in other masjid, I'm going to be honest with you guys, in this masjid, mashallah, tabarakallah, you guys have a very blessed situation going on here. Lots of people embracing Islam, lots of people coming to this masjid. Almost every week I come here, I see a new brother who's embraced Islam. Alhamdulillah, what a ni'mah for, for, for this community. But that's also a heavy responsibility, right? With great power comes great responsibility, as we learned from uh, Spider-Man. So, so with great power comes great responsibility, right? So the issue here is what? That... There is a big responsibility. So we have to ask ourselves, are we being a good example? And Allah is giving us the formula. Be people of tasbih. Be people of hamd. Be people who always glorify Allah. Always have the dhikr of Allah. Always taking away negative thoughts. Always reaffirming positive thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always what? Making istighfar and asking Allah to forgive you for your mistakes. And always remembering that Allah loves when you make tawbah. If you can do this, then inshallah you will be a good example. If you can be a good example, then inshallah you will be able to handle the influx of those who come and embrace Islam. Inshallah ta'ala you will be able to handle that by being a good example to those individuals. And so with that inshallah I close and I am going to open it up for questions and answers, and I'm hoping that inshallah we will have from the brothers and sisters uh, fruitful uh, questions, or more, even better than that, commentary bi idhnai ta'ala. So, wajazamdar khairan, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Bismillah.